Now, a hearing on the future of Washington, D.C.'s Pennsylvania Avenue. It was closed in 1995 following the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. A House Government Reform Subcommittee heard from Washington, D.C. Mayor Anthony Williams on Wednesday. Also, former Senator Bob Dole and others testified. It's over three hours. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our hearing on America's Main Street, the future of Pennsylvania Avenue. This is the first hearing of this subcommittee in the 107th Congress, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome our members, some of whom have worked with us before and others uh, with whom um, we look forward to working. And as you know, Mr. Tom Davis, who is here, was the former chair of the subcommittee in the District of Columbia for three terms. Not only is he knowledgeable on Washington, D.C. issues, but he is intently interested in the sound economic and financial health of the city. He conducted two hearings on the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, June 1995 and then a year later. I also want to acknowledge and, and uh, welcome Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, the ranking member of this subcommittee. Ms. Norton served on the subcommittee on the District of Columbia with Mr. Davis and with me, and we all know of her special interest and expertise on Washington, D.C. issues. I, I look to uh, her advice and counsel as we move uh, this subcommittee ahead <coughs> in continuing to revitalize the District of Columbia. Now, we have also uh, Mr. Scarborough uh, has also served on the subcommittee, and he will be at some point joining us, but he will be a member of this, uh, uh, this subcommittee. I also want to introduce Congressman Todd Platts from Pennsylvania. Though he is the newest member, Mr. Platts is also vice chair of the subcommittee. I'm sure he's going to be a great asset to the subcommittee, as he's already shown on District of Columbia issues. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was at the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative kickoff. So I appreciate his being with us. It's also a special pleasure to welcome Chairman Nolenberg, Joe Nolenberg, who is chair of the Committee on Appropriations, very important committee to this uh, uh, subcommittee. Very knowledgeable about the District of Columbia. He has attended many events, visited schools, has made it his special effort to know our nation's capital um, full hand and, and totally. Also, we will have, he's not, he hasn't joined us yet, but um, Mr. Fatah is the ranking member of the subcommittee in the District of Columbia on the Committee of Appropriations. I want to uh, also welcome my colleague, uh, Jim Moran, from the great state of Virginia, who up until this year was the chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on the District of Columbia. So thank you for being here too, Jim. Chairman Burton has shown great interest in the issue of Pennsylvania Avenue. He would have been here except for scheduling conflicts. And I do want to acknowledge his interest and thank him for his support on this issue. I also want to greet our witnesses, all of whom have had a long history regarding the closing of L'Enfant's Grand Boulevard. I want to thank them all for their interest. For some of you, it's a passionate interest, and preparations you've made to share with us today are appreciated. Senator Dole, we welcome you as a witness. You've been placed first on the first panel because we know that you have an extremely busy schedule and uh, could be called by the president for a sensitive assignment at short notice. <laughs> we are indeed grateful to you for giving us your time. We acknowledge your deep interest in the subject and also want to recognize the time constraints of the mayor who just came in from via the red eye and the council chair. Um, we really appreciate your presence, uh, uh, Mayor Williams and Councilwoman Kropp. Just to get a few administrative duties out of the way, first, uh, you may be aware that the full committee procedure requires all, uh, all witnesses to be administered the oath. And um, secondly, I'm going to encourage that opening statements and witness statements to be presented in about five minutes so that we will have time for questioning. All statements will be included in their entirety in the record, and there are some others who have submitted materials for the record. 
Uh, I'm gonna start off with an opening statement of my own and, and then you'll hear from other members of the uh, subcommittee. The purpose of our hearing today, as you all know, is to re-examine the blockading of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House that took place nearly six years ago. We, uh, we want to know how and whether the safety and security of the White House has been enhanced by that closure, and whether the Secret Service still believes keeping the avenue closed is necessary. We're going to look at the various negative aspects of the avenue's closing, the, uh, the adverse um, impacts on the District of Columbia on traffic flow, air quality, business activity, revenue loss for the city government. And for the first time today, Congress will formally be presented with several alternative plans for reopening Pennsylvania Avenue to traffic while offering protection to the president, the first family, and those who work in and visit the White House every day. A four block stretch of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House between 15th and 17th Streets Northwest was closed to vehicular traffic on May 19, 1995, under orders from then Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin. In shutting the avenue, the Secretary cited his powers as head of the U.S. Secret Service and those given to him under Title 18, Section 3056 of the U.S. Code. A subsequent Justice Department opinion stated that the code, quote, grants the Secretary broad authority to take actions that are necessary and proper to protect the President, unquote, including the temporary closure of any roads of the District of Columbia. Well, here we are, nearly six years later, and that temporary security measure remains in place. A lot has changed in that time. The District of Columbia, thanks to the steady hands of Mayor Anthony Williams, Council Chair Linda Croft, and the Congressionally Created Financial Control Board has undergone an economic and social rebirth. Congress, under the watchful eye of the subcommittee and its past chairman, Mr. Davis, and ranking member, Congresswoman Norton, has addressed in a positive way its financial and oversight responsibilities for the nation's capital. And the White House, we have a new president, one who campaigned to reopen Pennsylvania Avenue as a symbol of, quote, freedom and greatness of America, unquote. To be sure, the threat of terrorism that compels Secretary Rubin and the U.S. Secret Service to close the avenue has not disappeared. And under any circumstances, the mission of the Secret Service to protect the President and his family and the White House complex is challenging and demanding. It's a responsibility the Secret Service exercises diligently and without peer in the world. But it's become clear to the district's political community and, and the business leaders and to many of us in Congress that the blockading of P.L. Enfant's Grand Boulevard was a too severe overreaction to the fear that engulfed a many, a many of us uh, in the, uh, here in our country. This all happened following the tragedy of Oklahoma City. This temporary measure continues to present significant problems. From the economic and environmental standpoints, the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has done real harm to the District of Columbia. By physically dividing the city, the closure has curtailed business activity downtown, forced commuters and tourists to spend more time on the road, and placed additional financial burdens from lost parking meter revenue to higher metro bus subsidies on the district government. And while the federal government has reimbursed the city for at least some of the costs, I'm sure that Mayor Williams um, and Chairwoman Crop will agree that the restitution hasn't gone far enough. As we will hear in a few minutes, Mayor Williams, uh, Chairwoman Crop, and the City Council strongly favor reopening the avenue. And just last week, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, which represents every local government in the greater Washington region, unanimously passed a resolution urging the President to return this vital east-west link in the District of Columbia to the use of district residents, to the use of commuters also, and the use of visitors. At my request, COGS transportation staff has provided this subcommittee with statistics showing that levels of dangerous ozone-depleting vehicle emissions rise when cars and trucks are forced to travel at slower speeds, which of course is the daily consequence of stalled traffic around Pennsylvania Avenue. The Washington metropolitan area continues to be a non-attainment area under the Clean Air Act. 
I have some documents that, without objection, I would ask be included in the record in that regard. From a larger perspective, however, we must be vigilant in ensuring that the goal of responsibly protecting the White House and the lives of those who live, work, and visit there remains in balance with the aims of a free and democratic society. In closing Pennsylvania Avenue, I wonder what values we have compromised. The city, the White House, our national monuments stand as proud symbols of America's freedom. But the present state of Pennsylvania Avenue, which makes the nation's capital resemble a city under siege, a city devoid of the vitality of freedom, is an affront to our traditions of openness and accessibility. So it's time to reassess that decision, need to take a look at other options, and see if we can find a better solution. I would now like to yield to the very distinguished ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Ms. Norton, for her opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, may I welcome uh, you, uh, Ms. Morella, to your uh, new post as chair of the sub subcommittee and say how much I appreciate that Pennsylvania Avenue uh, is the first hearing under your leadership. I'm also pleased to welcome my colleagues who have shown, who have taken such a special interest in what the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue has done to the city and to the region. And of course, I especially welcome today's witnesses. This is the first hearing of this session on Pennsylvania Avenue, but it is the fourth on this important subject. I'm tempted to say we must stop meeting like this and do something about Pennsylvania Avenue. However, I believe the subcommittee must continue to meet and hold hearings until we find a way to return Pennsylvania Avenue to normal downtown city life as the founders intended and as a big complicated city requires. I am particularly grateful for the bipartisan support the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue has received. Each year since the avenue was blockaded, both the Senate and the House have agreed to appropriations language I originally requested in 1996 that keeps the Park Service from converting the avenue into a park as it originally intended. That final solution, of course, would have obliterated even the possibility that ingenuity, technology, and other state-of-the-art improvements could lead to greater access. I also appreciate the provision adopted by the Republican National Committee in its year 2000 platform calling for the immediate reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I particularly appreciate the willingness of the Bush administration to remain open to lifting the barricades. As important as all of the testimony we receive today will be, I expect that most of it will not differ largely, will differ uh, largely by degree from past contributions to our hearings. The longer Pennsylvania Avenue has remained closed, the worse the burden has been on residents, businesses, commuters, and tourists. Environmental pollution has also been a notable casualty. What makes today's hearing different from our previous efforts is the recent development of a viable plan. The Federal City Council and the D.C. Building Industry Association have done what the federal government should have done. In the midst of the most serious fiscal crisis for the District of Columbia in 100 years, the government closed down a vital artery of a great city. It is the government that should have commissioned studies seeking alternatives. However, government officials have apparently ceded authority to their least objective agency. The Secret Service, which had tried to close Pennsylvania Avenue for decades, long before the genuine security risks that have emerged uh, in recent years. However, faced with the Oklahoma City bombing of the Alfred P. Mora Federal Building, the worst and most tragic terrorism in American history, I did not call for the reopening of the avenue until a plan by respected security experts responded to the concerns of the Secret Service as stated when the agency closed the avenue. Instead, I worked with White House Chief of Counsel Erskine Bowles, the Department of Transportation, and the National Park Service to get East Street widened 
and open to two-way traffic at federal expense. We are very grateful that the two-way traffic on E Street has brought welcome, if incomplete and inadequate relief. The most important thing this hearing can do today is to center its inquiry on the strengths and weaknesses of the Federal City Council plan. The fact is the government has isolated security concerns and left the Secret Service and similar agencies to their own devices. Unaided by a broad array of assistance from the best minds in the society and state-of-art innovations from the private sector, the Secret Service has been left to use the same barricades it would have used in 1865 when the service was established. As critical as I have been of the closed minds of the Secret Service and the Treasury Department, however, they are not the root cause of the problem before us. Our government has allowed our country to become increasingly vulnerable to 21st century international terrorism while leaving those responsible with only 19th century tools. The most important recognition that congressional, uh, that needs congressional and presidential focus is that the problem we face is not merely Pennsylvania Avenue in the District of Columbia. The fundamental question America faces is how to maintain an open society when the threat from international terrorism is palpable. I will shortly introduce a bill intended to help us find an answer to one of the largest unsolved questions that has emerged to confront our society today, how to maintain the precious democratic value of openness while safeguarding our society from the forces of terrorism. Fortunately, I believe we can solve our Pennsylvania Avenue problem in the district without resolving the more fundamental question it raises for our country. As we see the great capital of the United States being systematically closed down before our eyes, it is clear that Pennsylvania Avenue is only the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Let us demonstrate that we are capable of taking on the entire problem by first showing that we can safely open America's main street. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton. I would now like to recognize for an opening statement our guest today, uh, Congressman um, Joe Nolenberg, who chairs the Appropriations Committee for the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman uh, Morella, <clears throat> for giving me the opportunity to appear on the dais, not on the dais, but whatever you call this thing up here. Uh, and I do appreciate very much the opportunity. We do have uh, in the audience and on the panel some very distinguished people. We want to hear from them. I, um, as the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, had been um, early on advised of the concern about the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue and would I do something about it very quickly. Well, I see in the audience that we have a great number of others that have uh, an interest, I think, that's probably somewhat similar. I think we have to balance um, what we hear, to hear here today, uh, the idea of national security, the protection of the president. Uh, I know that it's imperative that the, the needs of the District of Columbia be recognized and, that, uh, and responded to. Uh, Pennsylvania Avenue is clearly, clearly a vital artery servicing the city's downtown area. And one of the things I, I talk about frequently when I meet with some of the people that I see in the audience is one of the things that I would like to see as a goal in, in my chairmanship is to increase the economic development in this city along with education and public safety. Now, when you're talking about traffic, uh, uh, this traffic situation affects uh, so many interests. It affects the business community, uh, tourists, people who live and work in the district, and of course, it impacts the president. Uh, we're going to hear today, I believe, several proposals uh, and I would encourage everyone to, uh, to continue to work together to reach a consensus uh, resolution. Um, I am not going to ask any questions, uh, but I am going to rhetorically pose, or not expect an answer at least, from the panel before they have a chance to testify. But I am, I am going to um, uh, make a couple of uh, rhetorical, produce a couple of rhetorical questions that I believe to be questions that are on the minds of everybody in this, 
this audience, and I see some faces that, as I say, I'm very familiar with. Um, I, um, I appreciate very much uh, Director Stafford and the time that he gave to us uh, a short time ago to go over some of these points uh, and the concerns. And I, I think that I still believe strongly that an alternative solution needs to be found to ease the traffic dilemma. But the economic consequences, uh, and that can be, that'll be talked about, I think, at some length, particularly for the people who live and work in the District of Columbia. I mean, I feel that options do exist which should be explored further. Uh, you're going to hear, I think, today something about a tunnel. That's one such option. And that uh, obviously uh, would, uh, would do something about connecting traffic flow. What does it do, though, overall in terms of uh, uh, lessening the siege mentality of the White House being off limits for anybody within the range of a few hundred feet? Um, we, um, the traffic flow, as I say, uh, uh, has to be, a, it's a concern right now, and whatever, whatever is done in the end, uh, there has to be, I think, some balance suggesting that the White House is not off limits, that the White House is viewable, that traffic still moves, that economic uh, harm is not done in terms of, of some of the traffic flow interruptions we have today. There's the issue of terrorism, and I know that that's on the rise, and we talk about that in a number of ways. When I say it's on the rise, others would refute that there aren't as many incidents, but they seem to be larger and more devastating when they do occur. And that's, of course, the concern I know that the Secret Service has. A couple of questions I would just raise, and I know my time is weird, Chairwoman. I've got a minute or so left, do I? Okay. Um, do the leaders, here's a question that I think might uh, be appropriate. Do the leaders of the other law enforcement and intelligence agencies agencies agree with the threat assessment. I'm talking about the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, and does everybody believe that a tunnel could be a viable compromise to restore traffic flow as well as ensure security considerations? Has there been an accurate measurement of the economic loss? Um, I'm sure that the mayor would respond and, and, and um, others that the economic harm has been substantial, and the revenues that are lost by virtue of the rerouting has been substantial. And how do, how will you all feel about the tunnel and the park situation after the conclusion of today's hearing? Um, as I said, I do not want to see the United States become, and this city become, uh, a nation under siege, and it is naive to think that we can continue without making some security adjustments. But I do believe uh, we have to move forward and we must compromise to reach an agreeable solution for all parties involved. So I look forward to the testimony and Chairwoman Morella, thank you very kindly for allowing me this morning. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. Appropriations and authorization should work together and it's a, a pleasure to, to have you uh, chairing that committee. Um, in the uh, spirit of um, bipartisan and regional camaraderie, Ms. Moran, who is here as a guest because he cares about this area, has allowed Mr. Davis to give his opening comment now because of the schedules here. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much uh, by, to my friend, uh, Mr. Moran. For six years, I was honored to serve as chairman of this subcommittee. Though I am now pleased to chair the Technology and Procurement Policy Subcommittee, I'm delighted to be continuing as a member of the D.C. Subcommittee. And uh, as a member of the area delegation, I'll continue to maintain a very activist uh, interest in the District of Columbia and its connection to the Washington region. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman uh, Morella, for providing such outstanding leadership as chair of this subcommittee and for holding this hearing. I look forward to working with you as we strive to maintain our momentum for the nation's capital. This subcommittee has always taken a proactive approach to issues, and I'm certain that will continue. Of course, I'm also looking forward to working with the ranking member of the subcommittee, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton. We addressed many tough challenges together on this subcommittee, and we were always able to work together in a spirit of bipartisan cooperation. I'm confident we will continue to build on the progress which we made. Pennsylvania Avenue is America's main street. It is appropriate that on this, the first full day of spring, we look at the issues surrounding Pennsylvania Avenue with fresh eyes. The need for presidential security and for temporary arrangements to affect that security is not questioned. Let's look at the record. On May 19, 1995, an order was signed by then Secretary of the Treasury Robert Rubin prohibiting vehicular traffic on portions of Pennsylvania Avenue 
and certain other streets adjacent to the White House. In that order, the Secretary of the Treasury delegated to the Director of the United States Secret Service all necessary authority to carry out such street closings. The subcommittee held hearings on June 30, 1995, one month after Pennsylvania Avenue was closed. We held another on June 7, 1996. In addition, I testified before the Senate Government Affairs Committee on June 26, 1996. I was also a sponsor, along with Delegate Norton at H. Res. 458, which co corresponded to a similar sense of the Senate resolution regarding the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue. Congress has repeatedly gone on record in opposition to efforts by the National Park Service to make permanent changes to Pennsylvania Avenue that would preclude its eventual reopening. We succeeded in preventing permanent changes from being made. Recently, there have been positive initiatives, and we thus have the option now to take a fresh look at the entire matter. Pennsylvania Avenue is a major arterial road for the District of Columbia. It was part of the L'Enfant plan for the development of Washington, D.C. Any closing or reopening of this historic street has enormous symbolic as well as practical impact. We are well aware that the Secret Service may temporarily close streets to traffic, detain private citizens, and engage in various other security practices in accordance with its mission. But it is also clear, and this was brought out by our hearings, that the Secret Service may not make permanent changes to city streets in the District of Columbia. That is very much the business of Congress and the district working within the executive branch, and that's why we're here today. The closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has cut the east-west link in the nation's capital. The disruption created an enormous, is, is, it's enormous, it continues to grow. The city has never gotten used to this disruption, to the divisions and loss of revenue which resulted. Residents, commuters, visitors in the entire Washington region have been seriously impacted by an action they had no part in creating. The status of Pennsylvania Avenue is a very important regional issue as well as a national issue. This is not so, this is so not only because of mutual concern about traffic and the health of the economy, but because of the environmental impact as well. The district's part of a region-wide serious ozone non-attainment area. Our hearings confirmed that the horrendous and ever-expanding gridlock created by the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has an adverse impact on our air quality. All regional jurisdictions in Virginia and Maryland, not just the district, are compelled by federal law to take actions to bring the region into Clean Air Act compliance. It's been my view from the outset that the federal government has a responsibility to help the District of Columbia deal with the adverse impacts of the unwanted federal action in 1995 in closing Pennsylvania Avenue. It's my hope this hearing will serve to demonstrate the wisdom of working together to reopen America's Main Street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis, and I'm delighted you've continued to stay on this committee because I look forward to your continued leadership in the past and in the future. And now I recognize um, my colleague from Virginia, who was up until this time the chairman of the appropriations, uh, or the, the ranking member of the appropriations subcommittee on uh, the District of Columbia, Mr. Moran. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and uh, particularly for conducting this hearing. And I compliment the persistence and dedication of so many people within the Washington metropolitan area who never gave up on the idea that Pennsylvania Avenue could one day be reopened. Since its closure, we've learned of other possible avenues terrorists could use to attack the White House, from the air with a plane, by handheld rockets and grenades from nearby rooftops, to an assault rifle by approaching the White House on foot. We respect the fact that the Secret Service has the daunting responsibility of protecting the President, the First Family, and the guests who visit the White House. No one would expect us to turn back the clock and reopen Pennsylvania Avenue as it operated before 1995. I think, however, the Secret Service should be receptive to proposals that address the primary th threat posed by terrorists, a suicide truck bomb, while allowing appropriate vehicle traffic to cross in front of the White House. I'm persuaded by the recommendations of the RAND study, as well as other proposals that involve gates, the realignment of the avenue, the use of barriers to block trucks and circles that all combine slow down vehicle traffic and inhibit larger vehicles from approaching the White House. I think these recommendations should be reviewed and given very serious consideration by a panel of experts who can then judge them on their merits and weigh the level of risk each proposal might address. I defer to their judgment, but I think there is a way a redesigned Pennsylvania Avenue could be reopened to smaller vehicles without placing the first family, their guests, and thousands of tourists who visit the White House at risk. 
putting a barrier inside the city's urban core continues to have an intolerably adverse impact on residents and businesses in the nation's capital. 29,000 drivers, which is the number that crossed in front of the White House prior to its closure, have had to find other ways to get across town, adding time and additional costs to their daily commute. Some businesses have been inconvenienced. Others have been forced to relocate because they can no longer make deliveries or get from their offices to other locations around town in a convenient manner. I, H, and K streets have become even more congested because of the additional traffic they have been forced to carry. And an added concern has been the additional response time emergency services and ambulances have encountered as they are forced to detour around the White House to deliver patients to George Washington University Hospital. These concerns are valid, but as important is the symbolic message we have sent around the world with the closure of America's Avenue. I think we sent the wrong message that we are too willing to restrict our freedom, namely our public access and open space in response to any potential terrorist threat. We have allowed this threat to seriously disrupt our way of life within the very heart of the nation's capital. No one wants to do anything to jeopardize the White House, but I'm hopeful that this hearing can be the beginning of a process where we review and implement security measures that will protect the president while reopening Pennsylvania Avenue. And let me just say as a postscript, uh, I, I know that the Secret Service doesn't get compensated for their uh, aesthetic sensibilities, but whoever is uh, responsible for uh, that, uh, those cement jersey barriers and the chain link fence there on 8th Street along Lafayette Square, that's a dump, it's a disgrace, and all that, the, uh, uh, the littering and so on piles up there. Uh, we should all be ashamed of that, and uh, I, 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 there's, there's got to be a better way that people can see the front entrance of the White House uh, in a way that they want to remember uh, and that we can be proud of, and that doesn't exist today. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Moran. I agree. I'd now like to recognize the um, new vice chair of our committee, uh, Mr. Platts, for any opening statement he may make. I want you to know we're pleased to have you on this subcommittee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I certainly uh, greatly appreciate Senator Dole, Mayor, Mayor Williams, and Chairwoman Kropp for your appearing here today and, and preparing off for testimony. As a new member, uh, my role today is very much to be an active listener and to uh, gain uh, knowledge of how we can balance the threats to the first family and to the president um, uh, while achieving the uh, important priorities of reopening Pennsylvania's, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, America's Avenue, uh, for economic reasons, for transportation reasons, general quality of life reasons. And I, I think, as has been already expressed, um, reopening uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in an appropriate fashion will send, again, a message to the world that we won't be intimidated by terrorism, but rather we are a nation that stands tall against such threats. Um, and, you know, I hope will once again allow us to have that avenue embody Abraham Lincoln's uh, historic premise that we are a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and not one that's going to be under siege from anyone. So I look forward to your testimony and uh, to working with you and uh, Chairwoman Morell and all the members of the committee in finding a way that we can uh, uh, protect the President, First Lady, and First Family but in a way that uh, reopens uh, such an important avenue of our nation. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Platts. And now we on the um, dais will do some listening. So I'd like to swear in the first panel, if you would stand, and uh, Senator Dole, if there are any others who might be making comments who would also stand. Great, good. <clears throat> do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate uh, affirmation. I know, Dr. Sparks, that um, you are accompanying the senator as the executive uh, vice president of the uh, Federal City Council. But I will start now with um, Senator Dole, and then we'll go to um, Mayor Williams and Councilwoman Kropp. Uh, again, we are very, very honored. We appreciate your waiting to testify. Very honored to have your presence here. So, Senator Dole, if you would commence. Oh, that helps, right. 
I want to thank you, uh, Congresswoman Morella, and, and uh, others of the subcommittee, and Ms. Norton, who does a good job in the district. We've had a few differences of opinion on the World War II Memorial, but otherwise we get along fine. And it occurred to me that if you get this finished, you could deliver the tax cut more quickly to the president, too. That'd be another advantage <laughs> of getting this done, but uh, without getting stuck in traffic. But I'm here today in a th totally nonpartisan capacity. I finally got to be president of something, and it's called the Federal City Council. And we don't have any agenda. There are 170 members. There are men and women who live in the district or who have interest in the district who the sole purpose of the Federal City Council is to make the capital city, Washington, D.C., the greatest capital in the world. And so we're here in that spirit. We don't have any... I have great respect for the Secret Service. Uh, I've, they've worked, I've worked for them, and they were very good to me in 96. I had hoped to keep them longer, but, uh, you know, they left. And, uh, but having said that, I think it's... I think, as everybody's indicated up here, we, we're not going to go back and do open as it was in 1995. We know there has to be a different, different way to do it. And uh, we obviously have plans, and the plan we'd like to present just very quickly uh, would, would be the one that we think has some merit. Maybe there's some ways we can improve it. But I did want to, I think you recognize Ken Sparks, who's the director of the Federal City Council, David Ferry, who works with Ken, and also <clears throat> Gary Haney with Skidmore Owings and Harvey Joyner with Parsons Company will be if there are any technical questions on, on what, we, what we hope to uh, submit. I'd ask that my, I think you've already asked that the statement made a part of the record. And I'll, I'll skip uh, some of the information because it's already been mentioned by uh, members of the committee and other guests. But we understand, of course, the importance of protecting uh, the president those who work in the White House, those who visit the White House. But it seems to me that now, more than five years later, it is clear to us that the continued closure of Pennsylvania Avenue not only has cut the city in half, the nation's capital in half, but more importantly, has become, as, as I think Ms. Norton said, has become to symbolize that we, we are giving in to the fear of terrorism. And nobody knows when it'll happen, when it'll strike, but we've come a long way from the days when presidents used to open up the White House and greet all the visitors. Nobody had to have a pass. We understand there are reasons for security, but we also understand there's a reason where possible and where it's consistent with security to open up the place as much as you can. Uh, we're a lot, of, a lot of good people. We're self-confident people. We don't want to be held hostage to the threat of terrorism. And we believe there is a re responsible, reasonable way in which Pennsylvania Avenue can be reopened. And I want to make it clear, uh, as I said, we're not saying go back and just open her up like it was in 1995. Uh, our work, as part of our work, the Federal City Council commissioned the RAND Corporation to examine security measures currently in place in the district and how they relate to the actual or perceived threat. And let me just sort of skim over the RAND's principal findings. Uh, first of all, they noted that we spend more money, that we have better technology. Uh, we've strengthened the country's counterterrorism capabilities because of that. And we've, because of the steadily worsening situation, uh, there's far few terrorist activities now because of all the things we're doing. That's number two. And we, we've seen, uh, in contrast, the forward thinking that characterized the Clinton administration's overall approach to the terrorist threat, the issue of physical security around the White House was treated in a way that was both static and, and one-dimensional. Uh, I think it now, we also, they find in the study that the justification for continued closure now extends beyond the original explanation of assuring the safety of the president and his family. And I think that's important. Now, there have been a lot of number of measures, how do you protect the president, what, what happens when he leaves the White House, when he leaves the ground, when he goes to another city, whatever. And we understand all this is very important and certainly must be paramount. We're not here to dispute that at all. So just let me uh, sort of summarize what, what we believe and what, and, and again, our proposal is certainly open to amendment or change or whatever. And it's based on uh, not, not just members of the city 
federal city council, but experts who've given their input. First of all, we would narrow the configuration from six lanes to four lanes, two lanes in each direction without adversely affecting the avenue's capacity to move traffic. If you do that, the standoff distance, and I wonder if we might just point that out there, the standoff distance from the south curb of the avenue to the White House under a narrowed east-west alignment would be greater than the length of a football field or more than three times the standoff distance applied to U.S. embassies overseas to protect them against vehicle-borne explosive attacks. It's about, what, 300, and 300 feet? 385 feet. That's a, that's a pretty good distance. Second, we favor curving the roadway to, north, to the north between Madison Place and Jackson Place and this idea wasn't suggested, it was suggested a long time ago by Thomas Jefferson back in 19, 1802, and it's referred to as a Jefferson bow. Now, there, that's the original back in 1802. You sort of see the bow there, and then move it. Let's see the latest, uh, how it would look there. In comparison to the current east-west alignment of Pennsylvania, under the introduction of the Jefferson bow, would have the benefit, further benefit, of moving the roadway an additional 60 feet away from the White House. Increasing the standoff distance, I think with this, is 385 feet with the Jefferson boat. Without us, about 325. So we, we recognize that there also is a relationship between the size of any vehicle and what they might be transporting and what, what damage could occur. And we would bar any large vehicles from the portion of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. And it, to achieve this goal, we recommend a number of measures beginning with enhanced visual and electronic surveillance of the entire White House precinct. And next, we recommend the placement of attractive design manned kiosk at both 15th and 17th Street. Would you point those out? It intersects with Pennsylvania Avenue. And we also are recommending the two pedestrian bridges be constructed slightly inbound of the intersections with Madison Place and Jackson Place. And these bridges would have a vertical clearance of approximately, approximately seven feet, six inches. The bridges would permit pedestrians to move easily between Lafayette Park and the north side of the avenue, and uh, on the north side of the avenue, and a larger landscaped area on the north side of the White House fence. That would be right there, right? The pedestrian bridges would be structurally capable of stopping any large vehicle in its truck tracks and could be designed so they could be picked up and removed by a flatbed truck for the inaugural parade. I'm not certain that's very practical, but uh, that could be done. The pedestrian bridges, the man kiosks, the enhanced surveillance combined with the physical changes in the configuration of Pennsylvania Ad Avenue itself would permit the controlled reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue while providing an appropriate level of security for presidents. I was asked, in fact, I asked myself, how long would this take? And we're not talking about next week or next month. It would probably take, as I understand it, maybe a couple of years. That's a long time to wait. But if we're going to combine the security with other aspects, I think that would be some, that maybe be speeded up. But, uh, and we don't have to keep it open 24 hours a day. You could also close the Pennsylvania Avenue to all traffic from, say, 10 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, and I don't believe that would greatly impair the movement of traffic in downtown Washington. So it seems to me, Madam Chairman, that uh, this is not the only developed scheme, but this is a plan, but this is a plan that uh, we believe deserves careful attention, and we would hope, and we know the Secret Service will knows the plan and may address it in their testimony but our, we appreciate this opportunity. Uh, we're available for consultation. We're available at any time to meet with the mayor and uh, the chairman of the council, members of this committee, members of the Secret Service, and people in the White House. We hope to have a meeting with later on. But uh, we thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing the rest of the testimony. Thank you, Senator Dole. And uh, we appreciate the fact that this is the first hearing where we have heard those recommendations and appreciate the work of the Federal City Council. Um, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Williams, delighted to hear from you, sir. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Congresswoman Norton, and members of the subcommittee and uh, visitors, I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to speak to you, to speak to you today on the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I, I'd also like to acknowledge 
uh, President Doe, otherwise known as Senator Doe, for his continuing support in so many ways for the district, uh, from supporting our voting representation in Congress to testifying today on our behalf. He is a champion for our city, and we appreciate it, and I want him to know that. I'd also like to thank Council Chair Linda Kropp for her support in this important endeavor. I think the fact that this is a panel of local and national, national officials speaking with one voice, speaking with one bipartisan voice, I think uh, uh, speaks loud and clear and speaks volumes about the importance of striking the right uh, balance between uh, transparency and openness and protecting the uh, security and safety of our first family. Uh, members of the committee and uh, Senator Doe have spoken eloquently on that point, and I'm just going to uh, uh, shed a, uh, some light and offer some brief comments to try to complement and augment the testimony and remarks already given, particularly as they relate to commercial impacts and traffic and environmental impacts. Downtown Washington is the third largest commercial office market in the United States after New York and Los Angeles. This office market includes the area from the base of Capitol Hill through uh, our West End. With the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue and the limited west to east access on E Street, the heart of our city has become literally two separate downtowns, adding up to 20 minutes in a cross-town rush hour commute. The only way drivers can travel from east to west is by navigating the eight-block barricade around the White House, a barricade that's turned westbound I Street into a rush hour zone from morning until night. And all of us have been on I Street. We all know I Street is an example of the gridlock that's been created by this closure. Commercial activity in a downtown thrives in a connected environment, particularly in this knowledge-based economy when people move to the district because of our assets. Uh, the federal presence, the museums, the Library of Congress, the National Geographic, uh, well-educated workforce. These are all assets in a knowledge-based economy. All this requires and demands an interconnectedness and an interdependentness to a degree we've never seen before. We're actually retreating with closing Pennsylvania Avenue because by closing Pennsylvania Avenue and disconnecting our city from its center, we've experienced untold financial impact on downtown business development. Well, consider the eastern end of our downtown. The Interstate 395 tunnel right now is a natural blockade to the eastward expansion of our downtown growth. Commercial development is virtually non-existent on the eastern side of the 395 tunnel, a problem to which all of us are trying to uh, address in our downtown action agenda. But our downtown action agenda is going to be for naught, and our efforts are going to be for naught if we continue to have this barricade around the White House, which is cutting this organism, if you will, this, this community ecosystem, if you will, in half, this barricade, our residents, our communities, our business leaders, all cut off from the city's core. Uh, if you're on one part of the city and you're uh, working with another part of the city, uh, yes, we have an internet, yes, you can communicate, but you can't fax lunch, you can't fax a fire truck. I mean, you need to move goods and services and equipment, and that's why it's so important to have this avenue open. Long and short is for this city to continue to grow, we must be able to move people and goods from downtown to the corners of the district, and that means a reopen Pennsylvania Avenue the same way it means an open Fifth Avenue, an open Michigan in Chicago, an open Market Street in San Francisco. This is our main thoroughfare. It's got to be open, which brings us to traffic. In addition, the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue has further congested our downtown streets and added to the daily stress of navigating our city. The change from two-way to one-way streets and from eastbound to westbound circulation has increased gridlock and stalled the growth of adjacent businesses in the city. Prior to the closure, the United States Department of Transportation designated Pennsylvania Avenue as a thoroughfare on the national highway system. With the closure, traffic progression was diverted to adjacent streets like H and 9th Streets Northwest, which were already carrying 27,000 vehicles per day. And today, the increase in traffic has left more vehicles sitting in idle, emitting carbon monoxide and other toxins into the air. The district is already a non-compliance zone with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency for Ozone. By opening the avenue, we're going to reduce emissions and air quality will improve. All of us have traveled through the district. We all use our streets just like our residents, commuters, and visitors to get to work, attend social events, meet family and friends for dinner, and go home. 
We've all been late to, we've all missed events because we couldn't continue up Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the fact, fact, practical aspect of this. We all have firsthand knowledge of how important access to Pennsylvania Avenue is to those who drive and work in the district. The closure has literally, and this is what I want to emphasize in complimenting the other remarks that have been made, this closure has literally cut one half of the city off from another. In a city that's already got the same social tensions as other cities in terms of class tensions, racial tensions, uh, to add another physical uh, dimension to this divide uh, is overloading the camel, if you will. I think as we continue to re-knit the city, reunite our city, uh, build one city, uh, the, our nation's capital, one union, as President Lincoln would say, our ability to use Pennsylvania Avenue is fundamental to our social unity and our economic viability. All of our citizens in our city understand the need to protect the president and the first family, but we believe that the plan that is put forth by the Federal City Council does a brilliant job in making a balance between these two primary concerns. The long and short, Madam Chair, is that the citizens in every great city have free access to their most important monuments. In London, you have free access to the monuments there. In Philadelphia, you can drive past Independence Mall and the Liberty Bell. And as Congressman Morella will tell you, our chair will tell all of us, in Annapolis, you can park your car on the Brick Street next to the State House. We are the living, breathing symbol of a strong, self-determinant, uh, Senator Doe said, self-confident democratic nation. It's the embodiment of all that can be good about government. We are the capital of the world. People should be able to drive past the People's House, the White House, in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Williams. We appreciate your testimony. And I'd now like to uh, recognize for our comments, Councilwoman Crott. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman uh, Morella, uh, Congresswoman Norton, and other members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to testify at this oversight hearing on the impact and status of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. I'm happy to be joined uh, in partnership with uh, Senator Dole from the Federal City Council and our Mayor, uh, Anthony Williams. Let me express uh, my deep appreciation to you, Madam Chair, for convening your very first hearing as chair of this subcommittee on a subject matter that is so important uh, to the citizens of the District of Columbia and also uh, in the region. And this is one that also impacts the nation as a whole as visitors come to uh, their nation's capital. District of Columbia residents, businesses, and visitors have suffered for nearly six years with constant traffic gridlock that you've heard about, the uncompensated economic costs, and loss of freedom symbolized by the vehicular barricades that have been imposed between the east and west ends of America's main street and our downtown. I am here to reiterate the council's support for reopening Pennsylvania Avenue to vehicular tra traffic. I also wish to reiterate our previous request for federal dollars to pay for a comprehensive study which would quantify and compensate the district for each adverse effect of this street closing upon the district's economy and our environmental, historic, transportation, and parking resources. We are appreciative of the action taken by the 106th Congress of the United States in wake of the National Park Service proposal to create uh, President's Park on Pennsylvania Avenue to restrict the use of appropriated dollars towards planning, no, design, or construction of any permanent non-street improvements to Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. The district is also appreciative of the recent restoration of the two-way traffic on E Street behind the White House. We never quite understood how uh, the expectation was that some kind of disaster would only go from west to east. Uh, Two-way traffic is, a, is an appropriate approach, and it certainly has alleviated some of the problems. We remain hopeful that President Bush will fulfill the Republican Party platform position to reopen Pennsylvania Avenue by ordering the United States Treasury Secretary and the Secret Service to restore this most important of public streets to its historic use as soon as possible. 
Madam Chair, I would like to submit for the record a copy of the resolution which was adopted just last week by the Board of Directors of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government, chaired by my colleague Carol Schwartz, in which representatives of jurisdictions in our entire region have urged the Bush administration to reopen Pennsylvania Avenue to vehicular traffic. With your permission, I would also like to uh, submit uh, into the record excerpts from two resolutions on the Pennsylvania Avenue issue, which were unanimously approved by the D.C. Council as early as 1995 and 1996, because the provisions expressed then by the Council are still applicable today and will be until Pennsylvania Avenue um, is reopened. Without so, objection, both, both resolutions will be included in the record. Thank you, and the uh, Council of Government. Council of Government. Thank you. Um, the Council clearly understands the need to protect the President uh, and the First Family. However, it makes the following findings and recommendations regarding the uh, Federal Government's temporary restriction of uh, vehicular access on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, that it affirms the safety of the President. Uh, these restrictions have resulted and will continue to result in significant adverse impacts on our residents and our businesses. You have heard how this has just really bifurcated the city. It has had complete and total gridlock, H Street, I Street, K Street, uh, down almost to the monuments. Um, it is traffic, uh, traffic congestion nightmare. It's a parking lot. The only thing that would possibly be beneficial if we could just, uh, since it is a parking lot, put up parking meters and at least get some revenue from it. Um, but outside of that, it has uh, had a terrible, horrible impact on the um, District of Columbia. Um, let me also state that uh, we appreciate uh, the Federal Cities Council and uh, presentation of a plan. Um, that is one option. Uh, there's another option uh, that another architectural firm has uh, done. Uh, McClary and Laughlin, I believe it is, where they also have a, a bow in front of the um, White House. Um, there are gates there where, if uh, necessary, at certain um, opportune times, there's a need for uh, some restriction that could happen. Um, if you do not have that, I would submit that. I think there are many options that we could take to try to uh, secure uh, the White House uh, and the uh, President and the First Family. In closing, let me just um, suggest, picture this, 9 through 6 o'clock in the evening, 7 o'clock in the evening, all of a sudden, a four or five block stretch of Rockville Pike or Wisconsin Avenue or King Street in Virginia <laughs> is closed down. That is the same impact that we have had in Washington, D.C. with Pennsylvania Avenue closed down. It is a major artery in this city. It connects the east side to the west side. It helps residents of the District of Columbia to move through. It is a business section. It has an economic impact with the streets being closed. If Wisconsin Avenue was closed, it would severely hamper that particular area of Maryland. If King Street was closed, Route 7, it would severely impact in a negative way uh, Virginia. The same thing has happened to the citizens of the District of Columbia, the businesses within the district, and I say those who even come to visit the nation's capital. Madam Chair, thank you so very much for this hearing, and we look forward to positive action and outcomes from this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kropp, for your, for your testimony. I appreciated the fact that you tried to make it also close to home with your analogy, <laughs> but I can tell you that the Rockville Pike may not be officially closed, but with traffic sometimes it appears <laughs> to be closed. Thank you. I thought what we would do is um, each of us take five minutes in asking questions, then go back for another round, um, if, if you all have some time to, uh, to respond to the questions. So I, I guess I'll start off, and again, Senator Dole, I appreciate your testifying. I appreciate the fact that you are president uh, <laughs> of the Federal City Council. Right. And, and the fact that the, the, the RAND report that you commissioned 
uh, gives some, some um, I think, alternatives that we should look at very seriously. But, you know, we're going to hear testimony also from um, the uh, uh, National Capital Planning Commission, and they're, they're going to tell us about a task force that they are establishing now to look at, I guess I call it, security streetscape. Um, and I wondered if, if you, I wonder whether there is a response from the uh, Federal City Council with regard to supporting that kind of task force. I think it'll take like four months. If well, you, I, I wouldn't have any problem with that, but I, I might ask if it's okay to have Ken Sparks comment Indeed. because he deals with this on a daily basis and have more information. Great, thank you, we're Dr. Pleased Spark. To have the, uh, we're pleased to have the uh, National Capital Planning Commission looking at this. We've, we've uh, briefed the uh, commission on, on our plan at a previous session, and they've set a short time frame for the uh, looking at it, and we, we think that this is something that, that uh, could be very constructive. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the point, that we don't want to start studies, task forces yeah. out into the future with, because the mayor pointed out uh, the problem's immediate, and it's going to take some time in any event. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you would be assured that they would not be duplicating um, the report that you have uh, right. submitted to us and that maybe they would be utilizing you also in terms of uh, the work that they but do. As, but as we know, I mean, certainly no plan is perfect. It may be somebody, other people with their input may have some ideas that would improve our plan or someone else's plan or maybe even what the mm -hmm. Secret Service may propose. Uh, I, I would also like to hear uh, from the uh, from the mayor and from Ms. Crop too, with regard to your response to that report that the federal that the federal city council has presented, as well as what the National Capital Planning Commission is looking to do with their task force. Oh, time? I welcome, oh, Madam Chair. Uh, we welcome the uh, task force, National Capital Planning Commission. But I would echo uh, what Senator Doe has said. Uh, I would look. Uh, to the uh, NCPC uh, conducting as quickly as possible a report that would uh, augment and complement the work already done by the Federal City Council as opposed to uh, plowing over the same ground and just adding additional delay. And there are some areas that, that uh, would warrant some work and we welcome their, their, them looking at them, but uh, I don't think we need another redundant report. I, get, I understand they're going to limit their review to four months, so that's, that's fairly quick in this town, four months. <laughs> yeah, you're right, maybe, maybe it could be done even faster too since so much has been done for the last uh, five years. Ms. Yeah, right. Yes, I join um, with the earlier speakers that uh, speed is uh, extremely important. We have the federal cities uh, report, uh, NCPC will be looking into it. Uh, we have um, suggestions and plans by uh, other entities also that I believe NCPC has available to them. Um, they can look at the Federal Cities Report, they can look at the Lawson McCrary Report, and other reports that are already available, and uh, tweak each one of them and hopefully very quickly come up with a recommendation. Mayor Williams, have you, and, and this would be for Councilwoman Crop too, have you heard from residents, local residents, uh, with regard to the opening or the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue? Have they been apathetic? Have they felt strongly about it? Has it uh, come to your attention uh, in many ways? Oh, I've been, uh, I'm sure Chairman Crop would say the same thing at hundreds of uh, community meetings. And the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue is taken as a uh, given. I mean, it's taken as a given in our platform. It's taken as a given as part of our mission and in, uh, uh, in my mission for office. And while it is not stated uh, again and again explicitly by citizens during meetings, uh, the mere mention of it uh, brings acclamation. I mean, there's this widespread support for it in the city because there, there is the transportation impact. Uh, and speaking to business groups, there's wide, widespread in, uh, recognition of the uh, negative economic impact it's had on our local downtown business community. Because they recognize something very important. Again, you take two ingredients of a great city, a great downtown and uh, open, uh, vibrant, beautiful corridors and boulevards, and you're harming both of them with uh, the status quo that we have right here. You're cutting in half one of our major thoroughfares 
you're cutting in half our downtown. Uh, I concur with that, and the citizens um, really would like to see a difference. We tend to think of Pennsylvania Avenue only having the impact in that uh, 15th Street, say maybe to 20th Street area, but quite frankly, in downtown, we're feeling it as far back as 11th Street because you get that back up down at 8th Street and in downtown New York Avenue at 11th Street. So that's our central business uh, district uh, in the downtown area. So even those citizens who may not need to go on the other side one way or the other, from downtown 11th Street, it has had a negative impact on our traffic. So the citizens uh, just wait anxiously for it. Uh, my emails were full. We hear it constantly when we go to public meetings. My five minutes are up as we go through the question. I'll be back with other questions uh, after we hear from our other two members. Uh, so I'm pleased to recognize our ranking member, Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, Senator uh, Dole, um, let me just uh, say that if you were determined to be president of something, I'm pleased that you decided that it was going to be the Federal City Council. <laughs> The job you have, I can't say that I wanted you to be president of the United States, um, though I regard you as uh, an American who has made inestimable contributions to this country, and now for you to to continue to make those contributions by making them to the capital of the United States is something that every citizen of this city uh, greatly appreciates. I very much uh, uh, thank you for your work uh, on the council. Uh, may I ask you if you have had the opportunity to brief anybody uh, associated with the White House on the Federal City Council plan, or if anyone uh, associated with the plan has had that opportunity? Uh, we've, made, we've made a request that we have an opportunity to meet with uh, the Chief of Staff and hopefully others to the White House, and that, that request is yeah. pending, so we think it will happen. And we believe that in consistent, as that you mentioned in your earlier testimony with the Republican platform, there should be a willingness to talk to us and have us at least present our plan, present the RAND plan with our experts and uh, then let the uh, White House people make recommendations. Well, we were able to meet at the highest levels of the White House in the last administration. I very much regret that the last administration did not move on this plan uh, and uh, will continue to press uh, this plan because you have done a public service, a service one would have expected the government to do, as I indicated. Um, uh, Mayor uh, Williams and uh, uh, Council Chair Crop, um, <coughs> at the end, uh, when, when when this avenue was closed precipitously, uh, I was very concerned at the fallout of expense to the District of Columbia. And as I understand it, the district was compensated for a few weeks for the expenses of police who had to redirect traffic. Is that true? That's my understanding that for a few weeks, but that there is now no real general reimbursement for the closure, nor has there been a systematic analysis of the economic impact, although I think it's apparent even to uh, adherence of its closing that there's an economic impact. Yes, you, you say in your testimony, untold costs, and it's, it, it, it's very difficult to get an economic model that can somehow calculate the costs uh, of business not done, of business turns away, the cost to property values, the cost to commuters, the cost in time loss, that's, that's a, a heavy challenge. Uh, I do note, um, <laughs> thank you, federal government, that the Federal Highway Administration apparently allowed the District of Columbia to use its own highway funds to cover the cost of traffic control devices that had to be put up. Uh, do you have any figures other than the figures that, that uh, we were given a few years ago at uh, $750,000 uh, annually in the loss of parking meter and parking fine revenue because parking has been restricted on the streets uh, surrounding Pennsylvania Avenue? Oh, I can look and see whether there has been an update to that and get that information to you. I'm not aware that there has been. We very much appreciate yeah. receiving that information. <coughs> um, uh, uh, Senator Joel, perhaps some of your experts could step forward. Uh, I, I'm particularly interested to question some of the RAND security uh, experts. Um, 
I'd like to know, for example, um, whether they believe that closing down uh, a high profile part of a city shifts the risk to other high profile areas. For example, if you close down, uh, if you're a terrorist and they close down your ability to get to the White House, does that raise the profile of the House and the Senate, theoretically, uh, at least? That is a good question. Yes, we, uh, Congresswoman Norton, we do not have the Rand representative with us this morning. Oh uh, my goodness, I'm sorry. But, you uh, uh, I don't know that they addressed that particular uh, issue, that, that the uh, barricading of the uh, White House shifted the risk to, uh, elsewhere in the city. Um, I know they didn't address it. That's why I, I wanted yeah, to yeah. examine yeah. some experts who yeah, might maybe have we should the get background. That information. I, would, I would appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we lack independent uh, expert evidence, uh, and so does the federal government. Uh, it relies on its own experts, and its own experts have a mission. They're not supposed to advise them any, anything except what they've advised them. And that puts us at a, at, a, at a disadvantage. I have been briefed by the Secret Service, and uh, they have changed their stated ob reason for closing the avenue. They were real clear they closed the avenue because of the threat of truck bombs. Uh, now they say, we should leave it closed because there could be some cars. I suppose uh, if we take care of the cars through the ingenuity of groups like you, then somebody will find, in the Secret Service will find that if you rode a bicycle past the White House, you could, you could, you could possibly damage something there. I mean, they really do leave the impression that the Gold Coast is being moved here. I'd like your view or, or the view you may have from having spoken with your experts about whether your plan uh, poses a risk from smaller vehicles uh, that are not trucks, but perhaps are cars. You know, we made the observation, I did in my statement, that there been, we thought there had been a change in Secret Service uh, policy, gone from trucks to small cars, and uh, I, I think our study does include uh, reason that we believe that you can still have the small cars and protect the safety of the White House and the President and others who work there. Um, Mrs. Norton, our uh, expert witness today from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill has been responsible for um, doing buildings that uh, require a, a fair amount of security, and his name is Gary Haney, and I suggest that maybe he respond to your question. Would appreciate it. Gary. Thank you, Ken. Uh, the portion of our plan that addressed the issue of vehicle size was the, um, uh, the two bridges, the addition of the two bridges. Uh, not that we have any great love of the uh, uh, notion of bridges over Pennsylvania Avenue, but it seemed to be a passive way to limit, by passive I mean a non-mechanical way, um, to limit the size of the vehicle. And uh, we chose the height of about seven feet six inches, as Senator Dole mentioned in his testimony, as uh, the maximum height for typical passenger vehicles. It also happens to be the typical height of a standard garage door, residential garage door. So, uh, that was uh, our intention of using the bridges, picking that height, and limiting at least uh, to that size vehicle. Now, there could be um, uh, stretched limousines or other things that would increase the carrying capacity of a vehicle that size. Also, we, uh, with the increase of the standoff distance, we're not privy, as uh, I think is appropriate, to the measures that currently protect the White House from blast. And uh, I think a comprehensive study would have to be a combination of those measures that exist today with the increased standoff distance 
relative to the size of vehicle that could uh, pass beneath the bridge. Madam, Madam Chair, if I could add, um, I had a briefing by um, individuals who also looked into uh, this issue, and I would like to be able to get that information to you. One of the uh, issues that they had raised was uh, the bow shape. Um, the idea of the bow shape would um, increase the distance away from, from the uh, White House. And additionally, if there were something like even a gate that would have the same type of restriction, in other words, uh, a truck by a certain height wouldn't be able to get under uh, the gate, and it may not have the bridge that would impede the vista somewhat, and it would uh, have uh, the car type traffic going through. And the idea that they had looked up was that with cars, um, a bomb, of, it would limit the size of a bomb, which would then limit uh, the potential blast uh, possibilities. And that would um, somewhat uh, curb it. I had asked if they had uh, met with the Secret Service on that. Uh, they were going to, um, and I would like to be able to also present that information to you. I think the, the gist of your question is if, it, if there were automobiles, uh, there is a possibility that the safety and security of the um, inhabitants of the White House would be protected. Well, we'd, we'd appreciate having yeah, that information. You know, that's, that, that's, what, that's the question I'm getting at. And I, I can understand that without, without experts here, it's, it's hard to, to relate to that question to the extent that your experts could provide for the record an indication of whether they think uh, that, that um, mm -hmm. cars could carry explosives sufficient to do cons uh, significant damage to the White House, it would be helpful to our record. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll do that. Gentlemen's time has expired. We gave her a little longer because the questioning was, was so good and it was important to have it responded to. Um, Mr. Platts, please to recognize you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, again, I just want to first thank all three of you for your testimony and your efforts, uh, not just in this issue, but with you know, numerous issues across the uh, spectrum of trying to uh, have our nation's capital be a, a wonderful place to live, to work, to visit. And uh, in, in reference to the um, uh, chairwoman's question or comment about citizens raising concerns uh, with a, a brother and his family who live and work here in the district, uh, I can tell you personally, I've been lobbied uh, by a resident uh, <laughs> of the district, uh, even as a congressman from Pennsylvania, about the uh, importance of uh, reopening up Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, two, two comments and then one question. One is uh, I appreciate the uh, Federal City Council's approach in your testimony, Senator Dole, and, and being willing to even put forward and consider uh, options such as uh, it being reopened, the avenue being reopened, but perhaps not from 10 p.m. You know, during the night hours to uh, lessen the, uh, the challenge for the Secret Service as, uh, as something, although you're not advocating, uh, willing to consider as uh, one of the balances to be made. And I think that's an appropriate right. approach in finding a consensus on the issue. And uh, also, Mary Williams, Mayor Williams, on your um, analogy to 10 Downing Street and Parliament, I think are excellent examples, having lived in London and uh, stood uh, probably uh, 40 feet from the, you know, 50 feet or so from the front door of 10 Downing Street. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think another good example of um, free countries uh, standing tall to uh, whatever threats are out there, uh, as we need to do here in, in America. My, my one question, is uh, actually Senator Joe on the, the RAN uh, Corporation study, and it, it, I guess this maybe have been addressed uh, a little bit by the previous uh, that study available. Uh, questioning about the inclusion of the Secret Service. Um, they, I gather, were not consulted in, in what the, re the security review that was done. It was an independent review, kind of making recommendations uh, to bring forth to, to the mayor, to the council, and, and to the Congress, uh, and the Secret Service was not included as far as their estimates for, for distances, is that correct? No, I think if I, uh, I, I think they do have a different view. I haven't heard their testimony, but uh, again, I'd say that, you know, the Federal City Council is a nonpartisan, bipartisan group of people, and uh, we do have the district's interest at heart. We're trying to ha help the district, but we're not, uh, certainly, we're, we are concerned about the safety of the White House present, the occupants there. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Ken? Just that uh, that the Rand uh, people did talk.
talk to uh, security yeah. uh, people in law enforcement, people not on the record, but they did talk to people. Okay, so there were consultations uh, as part of the recommendations from uh, the law enforcement from, community? From the law enforcement community, yes. I think if anyone from Pennsylvania might want to lead the effort here, you don't have to have the name Pennsylvania on this avenue that's, that's <laughs> We closed. appreciate that name. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and uh, all the more so by interest. Um, uh, we want Pennsylvania to be regarded in an open, an open and open free state, sense uh, in all, all regards. Um, and, and just if I may, on a, on a personal note, uh, Senator Dole, to uh, thank you for your inspiration to me uh, in your record of public service. The, um, first campaign I became involved with as a volunteer was as a 14-year-old in 1976 when you were campaigning with President uh, Ford on the ticket. And uh, it was my predecessor's first re-election in your unfortunately unsuccessful effort with President Ford. But uh, I was delighted to have been able to volunteer as a ninth grader and at the presidential, at the local level in a presidential campaign. And it helped to spur my interest that uh, as to why I'm here today. So I appreciate your tremendous record of public service. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. You've been an inspiration to, um, actually to all of us, Senator Dole, uh, as has your wife. Um, I just wanted to pick up on uh, some questioning. I'm curious about whether or not there has been any ac account of what the expenditures to follow through with the recommendations of the RAND report would be. And do you have any on the cost? Any, anything on the cost? I mean, I, I mean, I realize in asking this kind of question, you know, when we talk about traffic and we talk about the symbol and we talk about pollution, that obviously there's not <clears throat> going to be a, um, the, the benefits are going to far outweigh the cost. But I was curious about whether, and nothing at this point. Mm -hmm. we, we do not have cost estimates for that particular plan. We were assured in the briefing that we had with uh, the uh, Clinton administration from OMB and from the chief of staff that, that cost would not be a determinant of whether this avenue should be reopened or uh, uh, just what would be done to protect the president, that, that, uh, that mm -hmm. these were all things that, that could be managed. And uh, th this particular plan would, would not be amongst the more costly alternatives. Uh, if, for example, we were to get into a tunnel or something, that would be much more expensive. Right, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, we're, we're, going to, uh, we're going to have a vote. At, um, too bad Eleanor won't be able to join us for that, but maybe she could finish questioning if she had any. But I, I thought I would finish with the questioning of this first panel with uh, Mr. Platts uh, before we do go over to vote. But I, I'm curious, uh, uh, Mayor Williams, have you found that there are some other streets in the District of Columbia that you think would um, uh, um, have the kind of the threat of, uh, of assaults or security would be needed? I mean, you've got a lot of embassies in this area. Obviously, all the embassies are here. I'm just wondering about, you know, the extrapolation of, of guarding the White House in terms of what it means to these other monuments, to the embassies, to other areas where you may sense the need for even greater security or great security. Well, I, <clears throat> I know that uh, we on a daily basis have a very close working relationship uh, with the Secret Service, and I want to commend them because I think every American yeah. citizen commends them for the work that they do in protecting uh, our, the president yes. and the first family and other important officials and, and, and their other uh, elements of their mission. We work closely with them, and uh, to me, the most compelling uh, part of the uh, Federal City Council's uh, presentation, uh, as it was stated here, is that if you look at it, if you look at their plan, uh, the setoff from the White House exceeds uh, the uh, requirements or the criteria for uh, dip, uh, U.S. diplomatic missions overseas. So, you know, we've stated, uh, we've already stated what we believe security criteria ought to be for important U.S. compounds, and this plan exceeds those same criteria. And I think that's the best, mm -hmm. to me, the best kind of common denominator to, co to compare what's happening at the White House with other important facilities. Mm -hmm. Did the, uh, Senator Dole, did the um, Federal City Council look at other um, residences of heads of state 
I, I'm just curious because I, I, asked, uh, I, I don't think we did. I think it'd be a good idea if we did do that. And mm -hmm. I'd also like to include a statement in the record from Senator Moynihan that he made at a press conference. He's sort of been the leader in this effort and he's done a lot of work on it. He had a press conference, I think, with the mayor a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And if I could include that statement, uh, I'd appreciate it. Indeed, without objection, that statement will be included. That, that's very helpful. Um, I, I guess my final question before I turn it over to, to Mr. Platts for his final questioning um, is, um, have you had any consultation with the president, um, Mayor Williams or Councilwoman Crop, about this? President Bush, maybe President Clinton, if you want to go back. Well, as Congresswoman Norton uh, mentioned, so all of us have had discussions with the previous administration on this at the highest levels. And I have personally discussed this with the president, uh, told him our strong feelings of our community, uh, the Federal City Council, to reopen the avenue, and that we were going to be press pressing forward on this issue. And he seemed to be open to, to uh, uh, sitting down with officials and going more, more deeply into the pros and cons of it, but seem open, uh, uh, how to put it, uh, sensitive to our concerns about traffic impact, circulation, economic impact, and all the symbolism that's been discussed here. I know, I know he's had a lot of other things yeah. that he's been looking at in terms of issues and timing and appointments. But, uh, but we hope that the results of this hearing that we will be able to meet with him and to convey um, what we have learned in this uh, re-examination. Well, as I leave you to vote, I want to thank this first panel and hope that we can continue to work with you, consult with you, um, so that we can have the reopening of America's uh, Main Street. Do any of you have any final comments you would like to make? A lot. Okay, right. I just Thank want to uh, commend the chair, uh, Congresswoman Norton, and the committee for conducting this important hearing and put, putting this on the national agenda. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Alan, if you, uh, what, you, splendid. Thank you. Then we will reconvene in the, within 15 minutes. No, I think not going to reconvene the uh, hearing on America's Main Street, the future of Pennsylvania Avenue. And again, thank you for your patience. I think uh, because you are veterans and understand the ways of Congress, you recognize the uh, intervention of votes and other things that may occur, like meetings happening simultaneously in various voting sessions and committees. And so I appreciate panel two and panel three for being so very patient, and it's a pleasure to uh, proceed with panel two, James Sloan, the Acting Undersecretary for Enforcement in the Department of Treasury, Brian Stafford, 
the Director of the United States Secret Service, uh, John Parsons, the Associate Regional Director of Lands, Resources, and Planning, the National Capital Region, and the National Park Service under Interior, Richard Friedman, um, who is the Chairman of the National Capital Planning Commission, and Emily Molino, whom I know is Emily Schreier, uh, who is the member of the Commission of Fine Arts. May I ask you, uh, in accordance with the committee, that you stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that you've all responded affirmatively. And so we might now commence, and again, trying to maintain like a five minute um, time, um, time connection would be appreciated. Mr. Sloan, you can start us off, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Before I begin, I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, it's, I think it's important for me to comment on the fact that perhaps by the end of my testimony, I'll still be, and I know I will be, uh, agreeing with the Secret Service's recommendation that for at least the time being, Pennsylvania remain closed. But I think in response to some of the early testimony, I'd like to at least leave you with the impression we don't have a closed mind about uh, the issues that we're discussing here today. I think that's important to note. You just have a closed avenue. That, that's that's right. this is about. <laughs> uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today about this important matter. As the acting undersecretary for enforcement at the Treasury Department, I have oversight responsibility for Treasury's law enforcement bureaus, which include the Customs Service, ATF, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, and the United States Secret Service. And I'd like to offer some general remarks and then introduce Director Stafford to provide more detailed analysis of this issue. As indicated earlier, in 1995, former Secretary of the Treasury Rubin directed the Secret Service to close a segment of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House to vehic vehicular traffic. The decision was, in part, based on recommendations of the Advisory Committee of the White House Security Review which was the most extensive review of security of the White House ever conducted. Other factors influencing this decision included the loss of life and injuries suffered in the bombings of the U.S. Marine Barracks in Beirut, the World Trade Center bombing in New York City, and the Murrah Federal Building bombing in Oklahoma City. The conclusion of the White House security review was clear. that closing Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House was the only alternative available that would protect the White House from the devastating impact of a vehicle bomb detonated in the avenue in front of the complex. The White House security review was initiated following several security instance, instances at the White House. And in addition to the review staff, Secretary Benson appointed a nonpartisan advisory committee composed of six distinguished Americans to ensure that the review's work was thorough and unbiased. These advisors were Robert Carswell, former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, William Coleman, former Transportation Secretary, Charles Duncan, former Secretary of Energy and Deputy Secretary of Defense, General David Jones, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Dr. Judith Roden, President of the University of Pennsylvania, and Judge William Wex Webster, former Director of the FBI and the CIA. The review examined several security-related incidents that occurred in the vicinity of the White House. The review was extensive eight-month study involving interviews and briefing of more than 300 individuals from over 10 government agencies and analysis of more than 1,000 documents. Experts from eight foreign countries were also consulted, as well as three former presidents, in order to bring additional perspective to the review. The review resulted in the issuance of a classified report of more than 500 pages, as well as a shorter public version of the report. Treasury's outside panel of distinguished experts concurred with all of the recommendations including the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. Before recommending to close Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House Security Review explored a wide variety of options in an effort to provide an appropriate level of security at the White House, yet minimize the public impact. After its extensive information gathering was complete, the review concluded that, quote, there is no alternative to pro prohibiting vehicular traffic on Pennsylvania Avenue that would ensure the safety of the President and others in the White House complex from explosive devices carried by vehicles near its boundaries, unquote. Since that decision, numerous studies have been undertaken and many proposals offered for alternative ways to ensure the safety of the President and reopen Pennsylvania Avenue to traffic. The Secret Service continues to monitor all proposals, 
and new technologies to determine whether they are, there are any alternatives that would adequately ensure the safety of the White House complex. After careful analysis, the Secret Service has concluded that opening Pennsylvania Avenue directly in front of the White House would increase the threat to the White House complex posed by an explosive-laden vehicle. We do not believe that the closure of Pennsylvania Avenue has affected the public's access to the White House. The White House complex is still visited by thousands of people each day, and the area in front of the White House has remained open to pedestrian traffic. There are several designs that have been proposed that would make the segment of Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House a beautiful and inviting pedestrian area. Our job is to protect the President, the White House, and the people who work in the building, and the people who visit it. The closing of Pennsylvania Avenue is a real public safety issue that affects not only the safety of the first family, but of all those who visit and work in the area around the White House. The Oklahoma City bombing, for example, damaged over 300 buildings, including 10 structures that collapsed. Any discussion about reopening Pennsylvania Avenue should and must include an objective assessment of risk. I'm aware that the National Capital Planning Commission has convened a task force to review the impact of security measures around the White House. It's my understanding that this panel is comprised of representatives from the administration, Congress, and the District of Columbia, who will work with the Secret Service and other agencies to review security and look at ways to make federal security less intrusive. There may be other independent studies ongoing. I can assure you that the Department of the Treasury will continue to monitor the issue carefully, and we will assess new developments as they occur. The Department of the Treasury remains fully committed to the recommendations of the Secret Service regarding security measures at the White House. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sloan. I appreciate your, your being here and, and the work that you've done. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Brian Stafford, uh, who is the director of our Secret Service, with the, uh, with the statement also, again, that I have great respect, dedication to the work that you do, and want you to know that. Yes, sir. Madam Chairwoman, thank you, and uh, thank you for your ongoing support of, of the men and women of the Secret Service. Uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, ranking member who was here earlier, Representative Norton, and other members of the subcommittee for uh, providing a forum for me to speak to uh, Pennsylvania Avenue issues. I appreciate the opportunity to address the national security reasons for, un for the that underscored the 1995 decision to close a portion of Pennsylvania Avenue to vehicular traffic. With your permission, I'd like to submit my full statement for the record. Without objection, so ordered. On May 19, 1995, then Secretary of the Treasury Robert Rubin directed the Secret Service to prohibit vehicular traffic on Pennsylvania Avenue and contiguous streets surrounding the perimeter of the White House. This decision followed an extraordinary consultation process among the President, Secretary of the Treasury, Attorney General, regarding the vulnerability of the White House and consequently the life of the President to explosive-laden vehicle attacks. Their support for this decision was overwhelming and unequivocal. The reasons supporting the restrictions have not changed. This decision was not based on speculation or alarmism. It was made on the recommendation of a nonpartisan blue ribbon panel of prominent Americans assembled to objectively study White House security. This was an eight month study and the most comprehensive ever done. In April of 1995, this advisory panel and the Secret Service concluded, based upon a scientific analysis of the vulnerability of the White House and intelligence data, that no alternative to closing Pennsylvania Avenue to vehicles was available. The recommendations were unanimous in that restrictions were the only way to protect the White House from catastrophic damage or complete destruction inflicted by a vehicle bomb. Having said that, opposition to the restrictions by some is understandable. The closure did impact the city and has made all of our lives a bit more inconvenient. However, the absence of traffic has made pedestrian access to the White House safer and more enjoyable for over 5,000 people who visit the White House on average every day. The Secret Service has been in the forefront of advocating urban design and traffic study mitigations that would comprehensively resolve the impact of the restrictions on our city and its citizens. But I emphasize that any plan that would permit vehicles within the currently established security perimeter 
will not protect the President and the White House complex from a catastrophic vehicle bomb attack. The Secret Service's long-standing recommendation regarding Pennsylvania Avenue was formulated by applying the same methodology and standards that we consistently apply to all of our threat and vulnerability assessments. I assure you that our decision to recommend these restrictions was not cavalier, but the result of years of in-depth research, analysis, and consideration by the most knowledgeable and experienced technical experts in this country. We have, together with our colleagues in the intelligence community, collectively evaluated the threat environment. We have looked at the explosive materials and delivery systems available. We have diagnosed our own vulnerabilities, and in the end, the Secret Service drew decisive conclusions about the likelihood of a violent and destructive attack and what we could do to prevent it. Let me also note that I have discussed our position with Director Tennant of the CIA, Director Free of the FBI, and General Shelton, of the chair Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. All continue to support our position on vehicular restrictions on Pennsylvania Avenue between 15th and 17th Street. Madam Chairman, we have witnessed a decade of well-planned and well-executed attacks, both at home and abroad, against Americans and American symbolic targets. The World Trade Center, Oklahoma City, Kobar, Saudi Arabia, the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, and the USS Cole. The mass casualties associated with many of these bombings is staggering and provides sobering evidence that devastating bomb attacks can and do occur. Since 1995, the Secret Service has worked closely with the National Park Service and the Federal Highway Administration to reconfigure the two westbound lanes of East Street and Northwest from 15th to 17th Streets. The restoration of two-way traffic on East Street has significantly relieved the traffic impact created by the original 1995 decision. Congress has also recently authorized a $500,000 grant for the D.C. Department of Public Works to examine traffic mitigation around the White House in order to develop a long-term solution to traffic patterns. These solutions include examining the viability of an east-west tunnel. We strongly support this initiative. As you know, the, Cap the National Capital Planning Commission has impaneled a task force to further examine security designs within Washington, D.C., including those currently in effect on Pennsylvania Avenue. The Secret Service has joined the commission on this important review, and the task force is scheduled to deliver its recommendations later this summer. I assure the members of the subcommittee that we look forward to the perspectives of other members of the task force will provide. In conclusion, I strongly believe the original decision to close Pennsylvania Avenue to vehicular traffic was the correct action. Furthermore, I will continue to recommend that the portion of Pennsylvania Avenue in question remain closed to vehicular traffic at the present time. Madam Chairwoman, thank you again for this opportunity to speak in this forum, and uh, I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Stafford. Again, appreciate your being here. You must feel kind of like a lone ranger, but uh, but you, you've done it very well, and I look forward to asking questions. Well, Ms. I have Parsons. To, uh, I'd just like to you. comment on the on the first panel. Uh, again, Mayor Williams, we have a, a long history of working with the mayor and will continue to do so. Senator Dole, I have a, a great amount of respect for. Uh, we've been on the road uh, a lot together uh, right now. We, we seem to be going down two different roads, but uh, he's a wonderful American, and uh, I can't say enough about uh, his efforts also, so thank you. The respect is reciprocal. Right. Mr. Parsons. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. I want to thank you for uh, your leadership in uh, bringing these hearings to, to uh, fruition. and. Uh, also providing us the opportunity to express the views of the uh, Secretary of Interior. Now, Pennsylvania Avenue is certainly among the world's most famous streets. Its 200-year history began uh, with Pierre L'Enfant, who was appointed by uh, George Washington to plan the nation's capital. Uh, L'Enfant's plan connected the two most important buildings in the nation, the U.S. Capitol and the White House, each in view of the other, uh, with a broad diagonal boulevard, which was named Pennsylvania Avenue by Thomas Jefferson in 1791. While Pennsylvania Avenue shares the, excuse me, while Pennsylvania Avenue serves the city of Washington as a major east-west transit route, 
It is known the world over as the heart of the nation's capital. On this avenue of presidents, we celebrate the election of a president every year, every four years, with a parade down the avenue and honor other national heroes and foreign leaders there as well. Also known as America's Main Street, the avenue has been the parade route of many of our nation's most famous public gatherings, the place where Americans from all over the country have come together throughout our nation's history to commemorate our triumphs and tragedies or to try to influence their president and representatives here in Congress. While it is truly more than just another city street, Pennsylvania Avenue also became Washington's first downtown street in 1801 and was with the establishment by the commissioners of the District of Columbia of the city's first market at the location still known as Market Square between 7th and 9th Streets. The center market was followed by the city's first financial district, part of which survives as the Sears House and former Washington National Bank building at 7th Street and Indiana <coughs> Avenue. Attracting a myriad of businesses since the early 19th century, Pennsylvania Avenue has been the key element of ordinary life and commerce in the District of Columbia throughout its history. The National Park Service is proud to administer parkland along the entire length of Pennsylvania Avenue between these two, two structures. Lafayette Park north of the avenue and White House and its grounds south of it have been under the stewardship of the Park Service since 1933. We have managed the tree-lined sidewalks, parks, plazas, monuments, and memorials of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, National Historic Sites, since their creation by PADC, or the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, uh, as a result of President Kennedy's inspiration as he traveled along the avenue uh, route of his inaugural parade. After the Department of Treasury uh, restricted public vehicular traffic on Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, former President Clinton's Chief of Staff, uh, Leon Panetta, charged the Park Service with developing a design for the closed portion of the avenue uh, between 15th and 16th, 17th Streets uh, for pedestrian use. Using a broad public involvement process and a design group composed of experts in architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, and historic preservation, we released our proposed design for public review in spring of 1996. The Park Service has taken the planning process for the surface treatment of the avenue uh, between 15th and 17th Street as far as we can at this point. As you may know, in the Interior Appropriations Act for the past several years have contained language prohibiting the Park Service from doing any planning, design, or construction of improvements of the avenue in front of the High White House without the advanced approval of the House and Senate committees on appropriations. However, as the steward of the parkland on either side of the avenue in this location, we stand ready to assist in the planning and design for the area with the, with the approval of Congress. In that context, you've already heard that the NCPC has established an interagency task force to examine designs in the nation's capital, security designs in the nation's capital. I'm pleased to represent the Secretary of Interior on that task force and the task force is engaged in examination of uh, security designs not only around the White House, but along all of the federal buildings uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue, as well as the monuments and memorials in the Monumental Corps. The National Park Service clearly recognizes the security considerations of the Secret Service, and with respect to the closing of the avenue, as well as our challenge to protect such icons of democracy as the monuments and memorials to Presidents Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Jefferson. Madam Chairwoman, that concludes my statement. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Parsons, and for the work that's done by the Park Service and Interior. Mr. Friedman, I'm pleased to recognize you. You've been referred to uh, uh, very often throughout our hearings so far, particularly because of the National Capital Planning Commission's uh, plan, which you will be presenting to us now. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Richard Friedman. I'm from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm chairman of the National Capital Planning Commission. The commission is the federal government's central planning authority in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding region. We are responsible for preserving the histor er, historic urban design that has made Washington one of the most admired capital cities in the world. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, up to report to you on our current efforts to ensure that security installations in the city's monumental core do not continue to diminish the unique beauty and character of our nation's capital. Earlier this month, the Commission established an interagency task force to evaluate the impact of federal security measures around the White House 
including Pennsylvania Avenue between 15th and 17th Street, and around national monuments and federal buildings in the city's core. We initiated this effort because we believe that we must find creative ways to ensure that our public places are respectful of the city's historic streetscapes and are at the same time accessible and safe for those who live, work, and visit the nation's capital. Good security and good urban planning are not incompatible. Our goal is to make the monumental core of Washington a beautiful, friendly, and well-designed urban space while having the safety considerations not unduly compromised. The message to Washington's workers, residents, and visitors must be of a city reflecting a nation where freedom and openness are valued and a police state mentality is not implied or conveyed. All of the stakeholders concerned with security, urban design, economic development, and traffic management need to be at the table as we examine these issues in a comprehensive way. For this reason, we've made every effort to be as inclusive as possible in selecting task force members. Serving on the task force, which I will personally chair, are Interior Secretary Gail Norton, General Services Acting Administrator Thurman Davis, Mayor Anthony Williams, and City Council Chair Chairperson Linda Krupp. Heads of other federal agencies will be invited to join the task force at criti critical stages of its work. These may include the Attorney General, the Secretaries of State, Treasury, Defense, and Transportation, as well as directors of the Secret Service, the FBI, and the Bureau of Tobacco, Al Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Additional cap participants may include the architect of the Capitol, the chairman of the Fine Commission on Fine Arts, and the executive director of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. In establishing the task force, we've been working closely with Secret Service officials and are particularly gratified that they have agreed to participate in this effort. The excellent NCPC professional staff, augmented by outside consultants where necessary, will support the efforts of this task force. The Commission has already engaged a nationally recognized security con consultant, John Sm R. Smith of U.S. Security, to assist in the task force work. Mr. Smith is a former senior Secret Service official. We are also pleased that in recognizing the Commission's unique statutory role in playing the nation's capital, including the White House, the House and Senate Committees on Appropriations recently authorized the Commission to examine security designs along Pennsylvania in front Avenue in front of the White House. The task force plans to evaluate all existing proposals, including the Department of Interior's proposal for development of a permanent President's Park, and the Federal City Council slash RAND proposal that would open the avenue to vehicular traffic through the use of protect protective pedestrian bridges. We will also develop and or be receptive to any newly developed approaches to this complex problem, which involves image, uh, issues of image, democracy, traffic circulation, and obviously security. I should note that while the efforts of the task force will first focus on Pennsylvania Avenue, our interest will extend beyond the avenue to open space, public buildings, memorials, and monuments without the, throughout the city's monumental core. Nowhere have the, has the value of planning been so clearly demonstrated as in the development of our national capital. We should do everything we can to preserve the magnificent legacy of Washington's historic L'Enfant and Macmillan plans. We expect the task force to be concerned with all aspects of security procedures that affect our public domain. This includes not only street closings, but the availability of curbside parking, the installation of security bollards, walls, and other barriers, security cameras, and the hardening of, of public buildings and monuments. We also expect to develop standards for beautifying security installations that we intend will serve as a benchmark for security design throughout the federal city, a clear guideline for various architects and agencies to use so that the city has a coordinated look and feel instead of a hodgepodge of divergent attempted solutions which have no sense of planning or continuity. Examples of security projects that the task force may examine in the near future include the permanent security, bar per perimeter security for the Ronald Reagan and state main buildings, the construction of the physical perimeter and security throughout the Federal Triangle, and the design of security features for the new ATF building at the intersection of New York and Florida Avenues. In addition, the task force is asking the architect of the Capitol to join it in looking at the security for the Senate and House office buildings and the exterior of the Capitol itself to develop strategies for security planning. Although this is an area under the jurisdiction of the architect of the Capitol, 
It's important for the design of the city that we adopt measures that are compatible for all of our important civic monuments. We've been gratified by the support we received from decision makers throughout the city for this effort. Congresswoman Morella, you've shown outstanding leadership and courage on this subject by your past actions and by convening this hearing. Congresswoman Eleanor Norton, the ch uh, chairman of the Federal City Ta uh, Council, uh, uh, and, and Mayor Williams have all hailed the establishment of the task force as a much needed and welcome step. I recently met with Senator Patrick, former Senator Patrick, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a longtime champion of renewal along Pennsylvania uh, Avenue, who has praised the task force initiative and has indicated that the National Capital Planning Commission is the most qualified and appropriate organization to undertake this effort. The task force has committed itself to an aggressive work schedule and expects to make its, rec its preliminary recommendations to President Bush and to Congress by July of this year. I appreciate your invitation to be here today. Look forward to your continued support of the task force as it will help, as it works to help ensure a safe and open national capital that's worthy of our great nation. And that concludes my formal remarks and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. I appreciate you coming here also from uh, my home state of Massachusetts and the work you've done as uh, the chair. Thank I'd you. now like to uh, recognize uh, with great fondness Emily Molino, who is a member of the Commission of Fine Arts. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a real pleasure to be here today <laughs> and to be part of these exploratory hearings on the impact of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue as well as possible alternatives for reopening it. Uh, I'm a member of the Commission of Fine Arts. The Commission appreciates the opportunity to join your discussion on the status of Pennsylvania Avenue just north of the White House. <clears throat> Since 1910, the Commission has been involved in all of the major planning and design issues affecting our national capital, including the White House and surrounding area. Most recently, this agency, along with the National Park Service, the and the Capital Planning Commission, has spent a considerable amount of time reviewing the current master plan of the White House, and we have given much thought to the future treatment of Pennsylvania Avenue. It's of increasing concern that not only the White House, but many of our great civic buildings and monuments are taking the look of a city under siege. The effort to protect our people and the buildings they work in and understandable because the threat of terrorism is real. Nevertheless, we cannot allow to be overwhelmed by fear. No matter how many are adopted to harden a building or how many barriers we erect or how apparently thorough we attempt, we can never be a hundred percent ability to acts of violence. What we need above all else is to achieve balance between these potential terrorist acts and the preservation of our sense of freedom and pride while allowing us access to our government in an environment that is not directly With respect to the design of security measures throughout the monumental core, with many federal and local agencies on measures that can afford increased perimeter security, not destroying the architecture of the buildings or their setting. We have found that the introduction of such as terraces and low walls can provide excellent barriers against vehicles without appearing overly aggressive. Hedges on either side of vehicle can also provide a degree of protection, more user-friendly than bollards. Sometimes commonplace elements, light fixtures, benches, for example, can be reinforced for protection. A careful study on a case-by-case -case basis would be more appropriate than using units or techniques, and would certainly be indicated in any study of this stretch of Pennsylvania. Regarding Pennsylvania Avenue, we realize that we must find a realistic way to deal with the threat of terror to stay. Therefore, a completely unregulated flow of traffic so close to the White House is possible. 
After much study of this matter, we are convinced that there are reasonable ways to improve security by totally isolating the building and grounds from passing motorists. Reduced widths of roadway, a possible realignment of the avenue, the introduction of circles and other control points modify the speed and volume of access are all measures that are feasible. Such measures in varying degrees would guarantee a much safer environment than existed previously, would not shut off the White House entirely. The act of approaching the White House and experiencing the nearness to the presidency is something all of us ought to strive to preserve. Architectural design consultant to the National Park Service, I redesigned the interiors of the three contiguous buildings on Jackson Place for the bicentennial in 1976. I love the transparency, the elegance of the approach to the White House across the gardenscape. The commission one of those buildings for 20 years, and commissioners and staff could sense the importance of the office of the president as well as its approachability. This is the house of the president, not a palace. I can think of no more worthwhile goal than to preserve, protect, and improve the connection of the American people to their government. The commission is prepared to work with other government agencies and the public to explore ideas for doing that. The views provided in this testimony are those of the commission arts and do not represent the views of the administration. That concludes my written testimony. Thank you very much, Ms. Molino. We, we very much appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to start off with a preface uh, um, from some articles. Starting off with the Washington Times and its Wednesday uh, issue this year, carried an article in which Jonathan Turley, who once worked for the security agency said, quote, the unfortunate thing about Pennsylvania Avenue is that we have significantly altered one of the country's most important symbols to address the most crude terror attack in the bomb. Bruce Hoffman, chief author of a RAND uh, Corporation last year regarding the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue, in the same article was quoted as saying, that the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, quote, only affects one particular category of rip, um, unquote, a truck bomb, like the one that ripped through the Alfred P. Mora Federal Building in Oklahoma City in 1995. And Gary Aldridge, 26-year veteran, guy who also worked for five years at the White House and authored uh, Limited Access and agent inside the Clinton White House, has said that the White House is already well protected and does not need a road closed in front of it to be safer. Very that, I, I guess I will, first of all, ask Secret Service, is there anything that you would allow of, of opening Pennsylvania Avenue other than just the beautification of a pedestrian? I mean, would you, would you legitimately be open to other suggestions? Oh, very much so. Uh, we have been since uh, the closing in, uh, in 1995. Uh, as you know, uh, Chairwoman, we've been looking at and concerned with this issue since uh, 1983 when the uh, suicide bombings happened uh, in Beirut and 240 of our American Marines were killed. We started studying the vulnerabilities uh, that existed at the White House at that time and can go up until this day. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment on that, uh, Mr. Sloan? I, I'm familiar with the comments of Messrs. Uh, Turley Hoffman and, and Aldrich, and uh, I think it's in, in each one of them are obviously coming at this uh, issue from a different perspective. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the Secret Service, the Treasury Department, and perhaps every at this table, every stakeholder that Mr. Friedman talked about, uh, really desires to open Pennsylvania Avenue. But obviously, the dispute is how 
achieve that that safety. Mm -hmm. And I think it's safe to say that he has caught up with the threat to the degree that we can feel comfortable in opening the street. I think we ought to be engaged in this debate uh, to include the comments from the from the gentleman that you referred to in the Washington article. And then as you as you look at uh, the fact that most security breaches at the White House occurred by individuals who have scaled the eight-foot uh, eight foot fences, uh, have uh, used guns or have fired guns near the White House. So far, there have been no incidents of a bomb carrying near Avenue, neither a truck nor a car. So what is the justification for continuing to close Pennsylvania Avenue to vehicular traffic when the facts uh, show Security breaches have been performed by pedestrians. It, there is no, it has not been any need demonstrated except that you look to Oklahoma City with the uh, World Trade Building. You are protecting against one kind of truck, one well, kind of obstacle. Closing, could be airplanes, it could be any number of. You're correct. I mean, the closing of that portion of Pennsylvania Avenue on the uh, the White House does primarily address one threat that is a huge concern to us, threat is a explosive laden vehicle. It does not necessarily have to be a truck uh, vehicle. It can be a number of small vehicles. It can be a small vehicle, a pickup truck, it can be a V, all of which can do catastrophic damage to the White House uh, and the President. And it's so the truck uh, is not an issue here, uh, which is one of the problems we have with the RAND uh, Commission uh, report. It can be anything much smaller than a truck. Uh, in, during the White House review, uh, there was uh, an incident in December 1994 when, when an, uh, an unstable person parked the vehicle on the south side of the White House said it was full of explosives. Uh, he was arrested and ultimately was not full of explosives. Uh, back in 1970, an individual who rammed the gates and actually got to the north portico uh, with explosives uh, strapped to the body in the car. So there have been incidents of explosives uh, in and about uh, the White House. And uh, it's a huge concern to us. It is just one threat, but we attack them individually. Uh, we Countermeasure in place uh, to tactically respond to just about, not just about, do we tactically respond to every threat in the air? Mm -hmm. That RAND report gives a number of suggestions, I would say, go from uh, six lanes to four lanes, and, and in all cases, you are increasing that distance from the White House to um, Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, and therefore reducing any destructive quality. Have you looked at those RAND recommendations we individually have. and analyzed them? You do not find, uh, you see any promise in them? Uh, with that particular recommendation, no. I mean, what they've done is uh, via the Jefferson Bow, they've gained about 80 feet, which isn't very standoff distance. Will that help a bit? But basically, uh, it's all determined on the uh, of explosives and also the structural integrity of, uh, of the target. In this situation, the White House. The White House is a 200-year-old sandstone structure. It's not a newly built federal building built to uh, blast standards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let me um, uh, kind of share the questioning with some of the uh, witnesses. Uh, Mr. Friedman, it, it appears as though an awful lot of work has been done in putting together a task force and it seems exceedingly well represented from different different areas but you know your and your mission is so vast I uh, I know you, you read it and I know I I read it in the book here because I was um, very impressed with what you were planning to do um, okay we expect um, well Maybe you can tell me while I while I find that all the monuments you're going to be going through other streets. Uh, there's so much that you're going to be looking at. Um,
tell me why you're doing all of it. Uh, honestly, take. And do you have the resources to do it? Well, those are very good questions. Um, we have we have an aggressive schedule, but we think uh, I, I think we do have adequate resources uh, for a preliminary base. I think, um, Madam Chairman, the the question is there are many proposals out there that have not been. Our view is that these proposals have not been looked at. Way. One architect comes up with one proposal, one corporation comes up with another, et cetera, et cetera. We want to try to bring all the parties together at a table or at a series of tables to try to look at the body of information and see if some consensus can be built out of that. We, we do have an aggressive schedule. We said we'd report back. That's not to say that in July we'll have a definitive answer as to what exactly should be done. But I think we'll be in a position to make preliminary recommendations or to recommend next steps. If you mean the entire scope of what um, the task force find my spot where you say examples of security projects that the task force may examine, or maybe you mean may, maybe may and it would be on with regard to Pennsylvania Avenue, because you are saying um, the of security for the Ronald Reagan. Buildings, the construction of physical perimeter security, the Federal Triangle, the design of security for the new ATF building at the intersection of New York, Florida Avenues, and also going into the um, working with the architect of the Capitol, um, looking at security for the Senate and the House office buildings in the exterior of the Capitol itself. Are we going to end up, or do you just see this as kind of a, a continuing? Uh, responsibility that you have as the planning commission. Would you look at the white at the Pennsylvania Avenue first? Focus on it. Um, obviously, I think we will look at Pennsylvania Avenue first, and and, and uh, it hasn't been said here, but clearly the White House, uh, and I'm not a security person, but has a, has a different category of risk and and. Uh, um, you will to a terrorist than targets would have. So th it is sort of the crown jewel of, of uh, to deal with. But I do think that um, it is an ongoing process. Obviously, when this city was designed, terrorism was not a factor. And uh, this is a, so we, we now face the city for the current uh, that we live in. And um, I don't think we're going the wheel, but I do think that the temporary, so-called temporary solutions of Jersey barriers and bollards and uh, guard booths and are uh, really sending the wrong message, uh, to, and uh, that we can put together, if you will, um, sort of a guidelines. Various agencies, there's so many jurisdictions that exist that various uh, agencies, uh, the GSA, the architect, the, the Park Service, and others can have, if you will, a, a catalog of acceptable ways, to de generic ways to deal with these issues. So it's a complicated problem, but I think it's, it's very much uh, worthy of, um, of understanding. Also, I think that technology um, is an area which we certainly don't have the resources inside our agency to, uh, d to deal with the technological answers. But at some point, it may be apparent that, that high-tech approaches or innovative technology will have some answers here. And we may need to ask Congress or some other source for funding for a certain, a certain kind, maybe a Manhattan type project of the best brains in the country to sort of solve this problem. Because in my view, this present situation is fairly intolerable. You've looked at the RAND, uh, the RAND report then. I have, have uh, only looked at it. Y yes, I have. We are uh, convening our first meeting of our task force on Friday, and I think he's going to make a presentation to us on Friday mm -hmm. of this the two days from now. I have a grave concern about paralysis by and that, you know, maybe we'll never get anything done because we'll keep up task force or, or groups to study and look at it. And, and 
Uh, in the meantime, as I've mentioned before, we've got all these other federal buildings, too, that have not had the barricade that Pennsylvania Avenue has had. Um, I was going to talk about the, about the technology. But, uh, it's not here now, then. And I would, I would also uh, ask the Secret Service if you'd um, like to comment on that, on the technology. You know, yesterday somebody handed me it with me. It looks like a piece of wallpaper. Proof. It just seems to me technology is moving so fast that there are all kinds of possibilities that may be out there. If either of you would like to comment on. Well, um, you know, I'm not a technical person and a security person. I, I do think that there are, that we hope that comes out of this and, uh, and maybe would would help this that people will come up with technological ideas or innovative ideas that can be I know Secret Service has in fact looked at these things over a period of time um, there, there should there ought to be technological solutions to some of these problems that are less obtrusive than than um, uh, as somebody said in 1850 um, by the way with respect to your paralysis for analysis by analysis comment or whatever that's that's not our goal here. We really want to be quite expeditious. And we certainly we certainly want you to be, and look forward to working with you. I, again, I'd like to certainly find out when you think you would have the Pennsylvania Avenue facet of that task force report would be completed. I don't know whether you want to give me any kind of a date for the record. Well, we said we would report back in July. And um, the by the way, in addition to one of the other, uh, I think, uh, issues here, other than your um, opening, I think also it's incumbent upon us to study, uh, to the extent that we can, the possibility of making the White House or other buildings less susceptible to uh, bomb-laden attack by, uh, you know, strengthening those buildings or in some manner. And so I think that's mm -hmm. another area that, that we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. But I didn't give you a chance to comment on technology and yes, the Madam Chairman, we uh, we at every technology that exists today. Uh, we have engineers, we have physical security specialists that sit on every agency technological group in this country, and has yet uh, come forward with any technology that will mitigate the concerns. Uh, uh, we continue to look. Uh, we hope that there'll be something today uh, that will date. Uh, we have not found anything. We've contracted uh, with outside laboratory, and uh, again, nobody has found any uh, technology to this situation. Mm -hmm. Well, this is supposed to be a, a temporary fix, closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. That's one of our concerns, and for this hearing is to make sure the temporary does not translate into permanent and it's uh, it, it is time with our to well if I respond to that just briefly on, on the temporary portion uh, and I think Ms. Uh, Melina uh, uh, this if you go back into the with L'Enfant's original plan uh, that plan called for a road in front of in front of the White House called for a uh, pedestrian plaza if you look uh, in the early 60s, a uh, architect uh, that designed Lafayette Square, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, he recommended to close Pennsylvania Avenue and to create a pedestrian park to give citizens actually more access to the White House. He also proposed a tunnel uh, underneath to traffic issues. We would very much support that. Going back and not back to the I, I can, re you know, I mean, there are people who could tell you when the Rockville Pipe uh, was not a pipe, even a road, it was simply a place where adventurous people might might to go out into the wilderness. Um, but I appreciate the comment. Let me let me ask you about what happened with this commission, Mr. Friedman. I've at uh, at conclusions. Uh, what is going to be the method that you decision making, census decision, the process? 
Well, I, I think it's not so complicated. I think that we're going to have, um, we're going to spend 20 days as you're spending hearing every idea that we can hear. A diverse group of people represent every, uh, every uh, group in this particular issue. And um, um, there'll be dialogue, clarity. There's a lot of people who have looked at this at the I think there's been, at least in my perspective, the um, core. So I think what we hope to do, uh, maybe it's a fact, but my hope is a series of intensive meetings we have to have is many experts and listening to every idea. There'll be bits and pieces and things, various ideas. People will, will in their preconditions with a complete open mind and a deadlock at the end of four months. Hopefully we'll have we'll the issue and be able to come up with some things. They won't be perfect, but they'll be as good a job as we can do. Molino, uh, you, you are looking at the concept of opening Pennsylvania Avenue to just beautification, sure that it is artistically uh, uh, arranged. We are hoping. It, thank you. Uh, there are are aware and try to preserve security primarily, but challenge security. Measures uh, until pedestrians and drivers of uh, small vehicles, uh, and we've looked at the commission. We've looked at a great many technological that would enable us to do that technology is really thing along and giving us a lot of really suggestions on how to combine security with good design. Conveyance uh, devices can be encapsulated in flag uh, signs, building signs. Nobody would ever know that they're actually the size of a playing card. Uh, increased in lighting systems enable you to throw huge beam light in a very Greek and finite that don't just fall out all over the landscape, but pick out what you want that beam to illuminate. And of course, computerized communications that make it possible to verify credentials of people at check just a scanner across their license plate, for instance, uh, or across their driver's license. So that I think that there are many ways that the technology could be improved to lessen the threat of terrorism at the same time acting together in a coordinated way to improve the design of any anti-terrorist uh, very very good points with regard to technology and i know that you know you're considering it just seems to me that the barrier on pencil it was geared toward massive truck with massive explosions and not really kinds of threats over which we have no real um, control at this moment. About it being kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, if you start having people fearful of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, perhaps you might even inspire in the sick mind the idea that something should be done rather than keeping it open um, is, is true democratic spirit. Well, I'm going to give you each one who would like to make any final comments. Um, and other members of the committee are, have been submitted for me to put into the record for them. And so if you do get questions, I hope you would be willing to respond. Great, good, thank you. Mr. Sloan, would you like to make any um, party shots? <laughs> I, I, th I think the hearing is clear. And in fact, I intend to stick around for the panel. I'm, I'm 
anxious to hear uh, firsthand of the of the uh, pack that the panel members I anticipate will be discussing. But I think all of this points out <clears throat> and helps us to recognize the dilemma that we face in law enforcement all the time, and that's yes. the issue between security and security bumps up against the concerns that the first panel, this panel, and the third panel in particular. It's a dilemma we face in law enforcement every day, and I think uh, the hearing has pointed out that it's not a dilemma easily overcome. I, I thank you, Secretary Sloan. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Stafford. I, I would just like to add, uh, Congresswoman, that the Secret Service is uh, and always has been extremely uh, to the inconveniences, in, in this case to the uh, Columbia. Every day we look for balance we do between uh, total access and, and total isolation to either the person or the facility that we're trying to protect and balancing act for us. Uh, I would very much agree uh, with many here today that have said that it's unsightly is. Uh, I don't like the way it works, uh, the way it looks as a Secret Service agent. I don't like the way it looks as an American. But there's a fix to that. And uh, I, I think there's evidence that it, it can be uh, very attractive. We've looked uh, and we've worked well and with Federal Highway uh, on the south side uh, of the White House. It, uh, it's starting to become a bit more appealing. Uh, within 18 months, it'll be uh, extremely and look a lot like uh, what Ms. Molina has described. I have one point that uh, there was a mentioned, uh, uh, Congressman Nolenberg mentioned something about economic loss in comments, and I can't speak to the economic loss, uh, nor do I think uh, too many is to the district. Uh, can speak to though, us would be if uh, a bomb goes off in Pennsylvania Avenue. Use Oklahoma City again as an analogy. Uh, there were three buildings uh, destroyed, 10 devastated, 168 men, women, and children killed, and over $700 million lost. Uh, that's not a guess. That happened in Oklahoma City. Uh, that can happen on our main street also if it's opened back up. Thank you. Have you discussed uh, the, um, your point of view with, with the President? I have. With, I have. You have. You have. Mm -hmm. what, is, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on which occasion? <laughs> uh, no, he is. Uh, he and uh, uh, was noncommittal and said he would continue to listen to all the right. issues he made a decision. Splendid. Mr. Parsons, I didn't ask you any other questions. I just know that Park uh, Service does a terrific job, and you do, and thank you'd you. like to offer any comments. Um, you know, I, I think we should look at this whole thing as, as a, uh, as, as uh, in an historical perspective. Um, I'm sure we're all aware of the obstacles of so many of the defense systems that we've generated in this country over the centuries. I think the forts that protected this city uh, are, are, are now parkland. Uh, the the uh, fortifications that laced the uh, East Coast uh, during the Civil War, those stone forts like McKinney and brick forts like Pulaski uh, were rendered useless. And I mentioned only in the context that to a temporary situation. Um, temporary is the wrong word to use in Washington, but uh, I think we ought to be very cautious that we do not overreact and, and build something or create something that, uh, that um, deals with this particular threat. And, I'm, and maybe that is your point uh, as to the dealing with these explosive laden vehicles at the moment. And, uh, in 20 years, it may be something very different. So I think that's the uh, import in, in, of the task force that it will be looking at at solving this in a, in a temporary way, a sensitive way, an aesthetic way, but not precluding options for future generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Parsons. I appreciate that. Mr. Parsons, I hope we didn't put you under fire. I wanted to ask you those questions about the task force and appreciate the of Thank you. Um, plan. I have a fear that 
that there is a existing great polarity between uh, between sides. That there are people who open it, people who. Uh, I think that what we've got to do is that we've got to encourage everybody to stay flexible about this uh, for the short term. I don't think that uh, at the end of this. There's going to be any absolute black and white answers that this, this is already, any solution has but I I am um, I do believe any almost any solution is better than the present situation the present situation in my view is tolerable it's unpathetic and um, uh, it gives the wrong message so that we end up with parks or or streets or what solution is we've got to get there get there fast get you know and uh, because this debate could go on forever and ever and that that would be very destructive thank you madam mm -hmm. I agree with you when you talk about the polarity it is very heavily weighed on one side in terms of, of Pennsylvania Avenue but trying to achieve what mr. Stafford has said that word mm -hmm. value. but I think I think everybody wants to open Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay, thank you, Ms. Molino. Uh, I just like that the White House is really more than a federal office in the eyes of the public. It's more than a monument. It's really so symbolic. It's and therefore, I think that we have to use the considerable time that has already been assigned to consider this. Uh, to come to a conclusion that will never be replicated in any other situation. It will be a unique solution to the security problem, not just reviving our old or even current ideas about security, but looking ahead to find the best possible ways to secure the White House, but within the boundaries of keeping it intact as this wonderful symbol of our nation for everyone who comes to visit us here in the district. Thanks. Thank you. Perhaps I recognize you, sir. Any questions or comments you'd like to make? Thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman. I, uh, one, just want to, as, as a new member, uh, trying to still learn how to be in six places at once uh, and, and working at it. And uh, although I missed your testimony, do appreciate your appearing here. And we'll certainly be looking at your written statement for uh, your insights into this issue and the uh, importance of us doing uh, a good job uh, by the people, by the President and First Family, uh, and how we find a balance on this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Platts. Again, I want to thank the panel for waiting, going through our three votes, the questioning, for being here, being prepared, and for the work that you have done and that you will be doing to open Pennsylvania Avenue. Thank you all very much. The full committee will actually be copies of the hearing. So they will be able to. Um, thank you. And the third panel.
always been my problem. This is the medals for waiting so long, although I think you're all pros, so you know what happens here in Congress about laying um, from the first panel to the last. Uh, but we have Richard uh, Monte, President of the District of Commerce. Thank you for being here, Mr. Monte. John Kane, who is actually my constituent, who is uh, Chairman of the Transfer and Environment Committee of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. Thanks, John, for waiting around, too. Albert Butch Hopkins, Jr., who is president of the District of Columbia Building Industry Association. Appreciate your presence. And J. Guy Gwynn, president of the District of Columbia Federation of Citizens Associations. Thank you, sir. And William N. Brown, president of the Association of the oldest inhabitants of D.C., and he's no example of that. When you, when you look at him, he's not one of the oldest inhabitants. It has to do with five generations or whatever. It's interesting because you're all uh, like presidents, and so I'm very impressed. So if you'd stand and take the oath for the record. Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show an affirmative response. And again, proceeding, um, Mr. Monte, although you waited a long time, you did hear all the other testimony, so you can respond and refute in any way that you desire. Thank you. Yeah, right. Thanks uh, for the opportunity, uh, Chairwoman uh, Morella, and for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm President I'm Richard Monte, President of the District of Columbia. Chamber of Commerce, and it's my pleasure to appear before you today to testify concerning the importance of opening the district's business community, the importance to the district business community of opening Pennsylvania Avenue. The D.C. Chamber of Commerce is the primary representative of the Washington, D.C. business community. Our 1,200 plus members include both K Street corporations and neighborhood corner stores. The market these businesses serve may be within walking distance or may be worldwide, but they share a need for the city to be open uh, for business. For this reason, the D.C. Chamber strongly supports the reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue. The District of Columbia is working hard to earn a reputation as a city which is open to business. The business community has worked to support the D.C. Council's efforts to rework our tax structure to bring the district into tax parity with surrounding jurisdictions. The District's new Economy Transformation Act is to attract high-tech startups to the center city and a spate of legislation summer aims at making the city insurance and financial services industries. The mayor has launched initiatives of Georgia Avenue corridor and east of the Anacostia River intended to bring new enterprises and residents to those sections of the city. Efforts to return major retailer retailers back to the district also bearing fruit. The success of these initiatives is, is reflected in economic vitality. Last year, the district added 19,000 and jobs, according to the Bureau of Labor, highest number in a single year. Our downtown Class A vacancy rate hovered under 2.8 percent. New commercial construction during 1999 and offered retail space alone topped 2.5 million square feet. With this new fatality, uh, vitality owes much to the careful stewardship of Mayor Williams and the re-energized council. It is built on effective use of the district's natural assets. Important among these that we are the hub of the metropolitan area. As traffic conditions have worsened, we here in the district have promoted our central location. Businesses which locate in the district have, a ready, have ready access to the federal government and to the institutions housed here. The district's current economic vitality and growth is to be sustained critical that the city become more, not less accessible. 
The closure of Pennsylvania Avenue significantly undercuts freedom of movement in, the central, in central Washington. It is difficult to argue downtown convenience effective enterprises willing to uh, locate to our town. The closing has harmed the district by sending out an image of the city as an armed camp. Hospitality and tourism is one of the city's core industries. 21 million visitors each year. It is critical to the economic of the city that we continue to build tourism, yet in images of concrete and guardhouses send the message that Washington, D.C. is not safe or or a hospitable place to visit. The Washington business community precautions for federal government centers located here. I believe that any valid policy purpose can be obtained by building a fortress on 1800 Pennsylvania Avenue or shutting down whole areas of the city in hopes of guaranteeing 100 percent security. In that the figure that with proper reconfiguration, it is possible to Main Street and to preserve the high security in this area. As a spokesperson for the local community, let me first correct the Washingtonians who use the city. The inconvenience that Pennsylvania Avenue disruption has caused. I argue for continuing the avenue and suggest that given the bad Washington how bad the Washington area one more street closing won't make a difference. I assure you that Washington business inconvenience and Inconvenience and sharply continues, continues sharply on a daily basis. Data collected by Washington, D.C.'s Federal Council demonstrate the problematic impact of the street closing, which has set the central business district west of the White House from the new offices, restaurants, and cultural centers on the east. The data shows that by 1995 closing, nearly 20, 29,000 vehicles crossed Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. The closing has displaced the H, I, and K streets on the north or Constitution Avenue on the south. This has resulted in an increase in volume on these routes of between 30 and 50 percent. Needless to say, this has significantly worsened the flow of east-west traffic in our downtown, increasing travel times and congestion. In addition to cost to businesses, such as the disruption of customer traffic, increased charges or loss of employee product productivity due to longer commuting times, the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue has imposed real costs on district government. Direct losses resulting from reduced parking and ticket revenue, as well as higher Metro bus capital expenses due to service rerouting, are estimated in, in the Federal City Council study at more than $460,000. The same study cites $728,000 in parking meter losses since 1995. An additional $1.5 million has cost the Washington Metro Area Transit Authority to reconfigure uh, some of its sites. The Chamber has reviewed some of the suggestions which are for you today, namely the, those presented by the um, uh, Federal City Council for reengineering Pennsylvania Avenue. If implemented, these plans would both provide security for the area and permit the reopening of the street. So long as it remains closed, Pennsylvania Avenue imposes significant costs to the Washington business community and on, and on the local government. It sends the wrong message to the kind of city we are, the kind of nation we are committed to be. The success of this subcommittee in formulating a plan which will permit Pennsylvania Avenue to reopen will be a significant contribution towards strengthening the relationship between Congress and the local community to benefit the city as a whole. The this chamber strongly supports your efforts to implement this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Monte. We'll be asking you questions after we hear the testimony from the others. Pleasure to recognize uh, Mr. Kane for his statement on behalf of the Board of Trade. Thank you, Chairwoman Morello and members of the subcommittee. My name is John Kane. I'm chairman of the Greater Washington Board of Trade's Transportation and Environment Committee. The, founded in, 19, or in 1889, the Board of Trade is the regional chamber of commerce for the Greater Washington area. We have a long history working to improve our region's quality of life. In fact, one of our first projects was to resurface the dusty roads in the District of Columbia. I also, during my day job, run numerous transportation businesses which have a lot of those nasty trucks, limousines, and buses that were referred to earlier. Um, I'll, I'll speak to that later during the Q&A session, if I may. I'm here today to speak in support of the company Pennsylvania Avenue, America's Main Street. 
and its symbolism of freedom, openness, and access to government. Closure of Pennsylvania Avenue has adversely impacted the mobility of, of district residents, suburban commuters, tourists, and visitors who either work or visit sites in the surrounding area. Unfortunately, these same vehicles are now diverted to other city streets, impeding traffic and burdening these streets with additional congestion. We recognize the transportation needs being generated by the ongoing revitalization of the District of Columbia. There is now new construction. There is now renovation to existing buildings, and there are revitalization of neighborhoods. The Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments forecast that employment in the District of Columbia will increase by 74,000 between 2000 and 2010. Additionally, the district will add 40,000 new residents over the same period. The declines witnessed during the 80s and 90s have clearly been reversed. Keeping closed one of the major arteries in one of the district's major employment corridors will only exasperate our existing congestion problem. The business community recognizes that the safety of the president must be the top priority. We believe, however, that there are more appropriate alternatives under study that would sufficiently mitigate potential security risk without shutting down the nation's capital piece by piece. Finally, at the broader symbolic level, the prudent reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue needed to maintain the openness of our government and institutions. The continuing slide toward a fortress of fear witnessed over the past decade is contrary to what America stands for. Known Washington architect Arthur Cotton Moore commented, quote, we have just delivered the terrorists their first victory, close quote, when the White House was ringed by sand trucks and large concrete planters following threats from Libya. The Bush administration has indicated its support for reopening Pennsylvania Avenue. Congresswoman Norton has introduced a resolution urging its reopening, as has the Council of, Council of the District of Columbia and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. The Washington Board of Trade joins these bodies and representatives here today in urging your support for reopening Pennsylvania Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. I will give you a chance during the Q&A to, to respond uh, to the uh, trucks and the dirty roads and whatever. Um, Mr. Hopkins, Albert Butch Hopkins, Jr. Delighted to have you here, sir. Uh, Recognize you. you. Uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and Congressperson uh, Platt, Platt's. I'm Albert Butch. Oh, would you put it right, push it closer to you for the sound. I'm Albert Butch Hopkins, Jr., President of the District of Columbia Building Industry Association. Our membership includes more than 350 companies and organizations engaged in all aspects of real estate development and construction in Washington, D.C. I'm testifying today to express the strong support of our association for a thorough, even-handed reevaluation of the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue. As early as June 1996, our association testified before this subcommittee, urging that a task force be established to, and I quote, find al alternate means of providing adequate security for the White House, unquote. With such a panel in place, we look forward to public discussion of the issues involved in the hope that Pennsylvania Avenue will soon be restored as America's main street. In our view, the security threats which led to a closing of Pennsylvania Avenue in 1995 are real. The responsibility to ensure the safety of the president, his family, and the White House staff is clear to us as it is to all Americans. We feel, however, that those threats can and should be addressed at lower cost to the district and in a manner more befitting the ideals of our nation. The economic costs to our city of closing Pennsylvania Avenue are difficult to quantify with precision, but they are nevertheless real. In blocking its major east-west corridor, the closing has effectively split downtown D.C. Crosstown access has become so difficult that many simply avoid the attempt. The result, the convenience of proximity in doing business in the city, has been compromised. Over the years since the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue, the MCI Arena, the Ronald Reagan Building, and other major downtown developments have come online. A new convention center is now under construction, but the full promise of those developments for a revitalized district, I would submit, is also compromised by a divided downtown. Beyond the tangible cost to our city, 
there is another larger cost that applies, one also difficult to quantify, perhaps, but also very real in its impact. I refer to the symbolic cost we pay as a society for installing concrete barricades across Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. In one sense, that cost represents a tribute we pay to terrorists. It is a payment, therefore, we should make only reluctantly when no responsible alternatives exist. We believe the proposals put forth by the district's federal city council to reopen Pennsylvania Avenue with restricted access for larger vehicles and with increased space separation from roadway to White House offer a practical and responsible alternative for White House security. Other architectural plans have been proposed to achieve the same purpose. Taken together, they would seem to provide a very starting point for considering responsible approaches to reopening Pennsylvania Avenue. They would also seem to provide an opportunity to reduce that larger symbolic important cost to our society. Our association, therefore, urges us as participants in the White House security review process to take a broad view of the issues involved, one that adequately addresses security risks, but also fully considers all the practical options for managing the risk. Obviously, the final decision on the status of Pennsylvania Avenue the president's. The security review now underway will hopefully help the president make the right decision. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, and now I recognize uh, J. Guy Gwynn, president of the District of Columbia Federation of Citizens Associations. Mr. Gwynn. Thank you, Madam. This, uh, in addition to uh, the D.C. Federation of Citizens Association, uh, I'd, I'd just like to observe here, I'm, I'm tired foreign service officer, and I've seen my share of terrorism and raids. These are problems of modern day life that one deals with. I think we can do it. And then before I, I start my remarks, I would like to request that the record include the proposed Pennsylvania Avenue improvement design of the DC, prominent DC architectural firm of Frank, Lozen, and McCrary and it takes the excellent D.C. Uh, or Pennsylvania study of the Federal City Council and RAND Corporation one step further in that it is for beautification as well as the security of the avenue. And for the committee's information, one of the, and at its discretion, one of the partners of the firm is here today and is available for comment and even a demonstration. So, I, without objection, I will have that included in the record, and we on the committee have all been giving given a copy of it. Also, yes. uh, who is the representative? Might want Mr. To Art Lozen is here at your Thank service. You. Yes, Thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm here today on behalf of the Federation to add that organization's voice to the many that are calling for the reopening of the closed sections of Pennsylvania Avenue. Closing of the wa uh, avenue was, in our view, an exaggerated reaction in the first place following the unfortunate close-range bombing attack on the federal building in Oklahoma City five years ago. Residents of the district, as well as the federal and city governments, have had ample time now to critically evaluate the hasty closure of the avenue between 15th and 17th Street in front of the White House to all but foot traffic. This effectively isolates the nation's house. Basically, the closure solution doesn't wash. This assessment and line of reasoning has been tried, and as we have seen today, has been convinced superseded, I submit, by proposed practical alternative solutions and by view on how to approach presidential and White House security. I would like to emphasize briefly two main elements in the situation surrounding the possible reopening of Pennsylvania severed as it is. The practical element of correcting disrupted traffic patterns for an important part of the nation's capital and the inconvenience that current detours have engendered and the equally practical proposition of the national importance of a reopened and freed up national main street. Regarding the traffic disruption, the estimated 29,000 cars that normally use the three closed blocks in front of White House have been forced onto H, I, and K Street inefficiently and inconveniently, 
Anyone who has experienced the present crowding, maneuvering, gridlock of rerouted traffic on these streets longs for the normal, orderly, as well as scenic flow of traffic on Pennsylvania Avenue. Co commuting patterns, delivery routes, and the, moment, the movement of clients and customers has been profoundly at a time when the city is doing its best to attract more businesses and permanent residents into the city, the last thing we need is a permanent major crosstown traffic impediment. Businesses have suffered. My own bank, the major Riggs Bank, 15th and Pennsylvania Avenue, is a skeleton of its former self. Impeded customer turnover problem in the downtown areas served by this stretch of Pennsylvania Avenue. District government sources have estimated that the city has lost, and I heard a different figure here today, an seven to $800,000 in revenue from parking meters now removed from HI and other streets. Metro reportedly has charged higher subsidies to the district because it has had to reroute its avenue buses. These services scratch the surfaces of the negative impact continued closure has on the city. In addition, continued closure is an embarrassment to the country. The statement that the closed National Avenue and the withdrawn White House conveys is the wrong. The present situation creates an impression of apprehension and a bunker mentality and arguably is a standing encouragement itself to prospective terrorists. Rather, the White House and its surrounding roots should project America's long-standing to openness the executive mansion should be the people's showplace, not the people's bunker. There are several objective plans already obje uh, produced by the non-government uh, community for reasonable, safe, and even enhanced attractiveness for the reopening. The Federation cites especially the excellent RAND Corporation commissioned by the Federal City Council. Also, I want to note for the committee's attention the schema that I've just, just mentioned to you of Frank Lowe's in closing, the Federation is the earliest possible opening of Pennsylvania Avenue in the areas surrounding the White House. Two, it agrees with proposals to reconfigure the avenue as necessary, including Jefferson Bow, to reduce traffic volume and control vehicles. Three, it agrees that traffic devices and overhead barriers may be necessary, as well as other security devices to control large vehicles, and finally, recommends that this subcommittee respond positively. We believe will be an overwhelming sentiment for the reopening of the nation's main streets. <laughs> that concludes my remarks, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Gwynn, and thank you for your service in our, our uh, foreign service. Uh, now, please to recognize Mr. William Brown president of the Association of the Oldest Inhabitants. People have asked me about that. You can explain it. Congresswoman Morales, esteemed committee members and ladies and gentlemen, I am William Brown, the current president of the Association of the Oldest Inhabitants of the District of Columbia. Founded on December 7, 1965, OI is the district's oldest annually active civic association. It was founded by 31 prominent and businessmen in an effort to restore the capital's dignity following the Civil War. At a time when the post-war population was growing, returning soldiers and refugees, the city was plagued by linked divisive sectional loyalties. These 31 citizens were determined to keep alive the instances of the past history of our city to emphasize respect for local government and national patriotism and sectional differences. I have with me today Nelson Ryman Snyder, who's of our board and the historian for the AOI. And today, nearly 300 members of the AOI meets monthly to continue our tradition of providing our members an opportunity to share reminiscences of their lives in the district, together with hosting distinguished guests and scholars who inform us of important historical facts and future developments likely to impact the heritage and the heritage value of our wonderful city. Since the closing of Pennsylvania, Avenue in front of the White House more than five years ago after the devastating destruction of the Murrah Building in Oklahoma. The AOI has continued to go on record to help seek solutions to restore America's Avenue to its original open status. We recognize and appreciate the United States Secret Service's concern 
and action to take immediate steps to better secure the White House. However, we now believe the time has come to re-examine this action and strive to restore the avenue to its original condition. Several unfortunate events that threats to the safety of the President exist even with the avenue closed to vehicular traffic. The AOI has been a staunch supporter of the reopening efforts, and our past president, Harold Gray, testified before the National Capital Planning Commission on this matter at their hearings this past year. The AOI has supported past efforts which sought to restore L'Enfant and McMillan plans for the city of Washington. These have included the G Street in front of the Martin Luther King Memorial Library and areas near the new MCI Center suffered from years of neglect closed to vehicular traffic. Those same sad consequences can be seen emerging in the areas immediately adjacent to Lafayette Square since the Pennsylvania Avenue five years ago, as this area becomes less vital because citizens find fewer opportunities to be there. Members of the AOI have followed with great interest the efforts of the Federal City Council, together with those of the Federation of Citizen Association, Congresswoman Eleanor Norton, and Mayor Anthony Williams in this effort. We appreciate the continuing debate and quest for a solution, as evidenced by the of Washington's own Arthur Cotton Moore as recently as his past October in the Washington Post. And other architectural firms have proposed several solutions to address the re while taking steps to preserve the security features sought by the United States Secret Service. The AOI would like to see the avenue restored to its full open grandeur. We believe that whatever steps are taken to minimize risk Solutions should not limit the reopening automobile traffic only. Charter buses and metro buses provide the means by which many view and enjoy the resource which is the White House. A reconfiguration of the avenue by the architectural firm Lozen and McCreary provide this opportunity while simultaneously providing increased security. While truck traffic should certainly we believe that to deprive tourists this view of the White House would be unfortunate. But please know that the Association of the Oldest Inhabitants of Columbia continues its effort, in its efforts to seek the reopening of this major transportation artery that represents less AOI's ideal. Many of our members can still recall the days when they used the White House grounds as a cut between their bottom neighborhoods and the commercial enticements of the 14th block of F Street, areas east of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Reopening may not more fully our sense of security and community to those days 70 years ago when children frolicked on the White House grounds, but it will demonstrate our determination to not hostage to fear or, as Congressman George Will observed in May of last year, present to the world the clenched face of a bunker of concrete barriers that close the avenue. Thank you for this opportunity for the Association of Oldest Inhabitants of the Dist District of Columbia to testify before your committee today. Forward to the reopening and restoration of Grand Avenue. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. You know, um, I was looking at this new Pennsylvania Avenue plan that uh, Frank McCreary Architects presented. Could I? Uh, the representative from that company very briefly, briefly explain it to us. Could I, may I swear you in? Yes, you may. Would you uh, raise your right hand? This is Mr. Bud. Sorry. Do you swear the uh, testimony you're about to give comments are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Right. Fine. Here. Simply look at the diagram here. I can't figure, figure just briefly.
our proposed action two, city council's plan, uh, which which we've all seen presented here today, it picks up on some of the issues, uh, including reopening the, the avenue to video, but it adds other features as well, which <laughs> will allow security over even the existing condition that's there today. It also takes the premise that by reopening the avenue, it should be made a more beautiful place, even if possible, than it was before the avenue was closed. So we see it as an opportunity to do beautiful design and extremely high security in the same aspect. Our proposal includes guard houses at 17th Streets, traffic circles in front of the Treasury Building and the OEOB, which slow traffic and reduce the lanes from three down to two. In addition, the traffic circles allow rejected vehicles to exit uh, back to 15th and 17th streets without having to back up, and uh, which they would have to do with a, without the traffic circles. Rather than the pedestrian bridges which have been proposed, we propose gates and gatehouses that allows we believe even more flexibility. The gates can be closed or they can be opened. In addition, there are vehicular gates as well as pedestrian gates. The Secret Service would be able to the entire perimeter from pedestrian as well as vehicular traffic, a feature which they don't have now. The gates would have decorative steel trusses <coughs> on top of them to prevent larger vehicles from being able to penetrate. In addition, the gatehouse provides staff. We, we don't think any solution that relies on a security feature or a single layer of security is going to be viable. We see this as a series of manned checkpoints. The gatehouses, parking spaces where uh, Secret Service Suburbans can be parked, and the guardhouse. Each, at each level, the Secret Service has the ability through telescoping bollards, which would pop out of the street, to stop traffic instantaneously. Uh, we believe that's the only way of opening the avenue, but giving the Secret Service the security and the control that they need to be able to, to do their job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take a long time to go on Pennsylvania Avenue, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> By the time you go through the circles and the gates and uh, but I, I, I very much um, appreciate that uh, explanation. Well, my, my question is going to be a little different. You're the final panel. You waited through this whole hearing. You have had an opportunity to hear Senator Dole and the Federal uh, City Council and their plan, the RAND report. You've heard the, the mayor talk about the adverse consequences. You've heard the council uh, president um, talk about the resolutions that they passed to open the um, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. You've heard the uh, uh, Acting Secretary of Treasury um, give you a little bit of history and why it is necessary that, it, that we have adequate precautions which would consist of keeping it closed. You've heard from the Director of the Secret Service, uh, John Parsons um, of the National Park Service, uh, Richard Friedman, who is setting up, wants to set up a task force to look at Pennsylvania Avenue closing, but would go beyond that with the security streetscape uh, plan. Um, and you've heard uh, Ms. Molino, the Commission on Fine Arts. I would um, like to ask you, this is your chance to get in your comments with regard to, I have your testimony, um, it's been in, it's in the record, We've all looked at it in advance of your speaking and appreciate your comments. I'd like to get your reaction to what has happened today. Any, re any reaction you have or any response you might have. You have all talked about, I appreciated the fact that mention was made of no such thing as 100% security. I have always felt that way. Um, that we can't have a fortress around the White House, America's main street. What has happened in uh, throughout the world, at uh, uh, places that have um, had international significance, in the United States, um, and um, uh, what what this uh, what this symbolizes. So, if you would just like to, kind of in a free flow fashion, tell me what is your 
gut reaction to what you have heard today? Uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised that uh, the issue appears to be open in the, in the minds of the uh, Secret Service and the Treasury Department about uh, alternatives. They're not stuck on this plan uh, to keep it closed. Uh, they're open to options, and that was very encouraging. Uh, the four-month uh, time span that the National Capital Planning Commission says they're going to put on the uh, recommendation for opening Pennsylvania Avenue is uh, likewise encouraging. Um, I think uh, we had a chance to tell them that the closing of Pennsylvania Avenue is very onerous on the businesses, both large and small, in conducting their business because of the barricades that have been put up on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue has impeded the uh, productivity of companies. It is uh, cut into their cost of doing business. It, um, it affects them in a deep way. There are lo lots of complaints, uh, uh, Chairwoman Morella, from businesses, large and small, about the inconvenience of the street opening on their daily activities. Um, so what I picked up today is that uh, we're going to get some movement. The, there is uh, some openness there on the part of the Secret Service, and that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll keep uh, uh, reconfirming with them their openness. My Mr. observations are that, one, when you're on the third panel, you're probably going to have lunch here. <laughs> it wasn't a bad meal. Sorry, we didn't have You guys do okay. Um, I, I, too, was intrigued by the commonality of belief that the, the avenue should be opened. It's just to what degree. I uh, appreciate your comment of paralysis by analysis, and I'm afraid that's where this may head if the Secret Service, is he still here, by the way? <laughs> Don't mess with the Secret Service. They do great work. Um, but, but, I, but I also think that it, it's in their, their best interest to keep that road closed. I know that uh, President Clinton did not want it closed. Uh, they basically came to him and said, this is what we should do for your safety and the safety of your family. Uh, I know that President Bush has, has an open mind to it. Uh, I still think he will listen to what the Secret Service wants. Um, he's, he, he would be foolish not to do that. Um, so I, I think if we can, as, as Richard said, I, I am intrigued to hear that the Secret Service is open to some adjustment to it um, that, that would prohibit vehicles that were, were, were mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm, I think I'm, I'm intrigued. What do, what do you think about the National Capital Planning um, Commission's task force? I think if you want to put something into um, uh, paralysis by analysis. <laughs> you create a task force, and uh, and then when they come back, you create a blue ribbon panel. Um, and then when that doesn't work, you you, you refer it to another committee for study. <laughs> um, I I I, uh, I would guess that they they certainly need to weigh in. They are talented in in um, in, in their observations, um, uh, but I would I would urge that that be done in a, in a uh, in a quick manner, and not have it drag out. I can see you know the ways of Washington, and we must be careful of those barriers. Right. Well, uh, Madam Chair, I likewise uh, was encouraged somewhat to hear that the Secret Service uh, sort of changed their, I guess, position on this matter over a period of time. I'm not convinced, however, that uh, they would be willing to do anything other than consider a tunnel uh, to uh, move traffic uh, east and west. Uh, so I'm not, I, I kind of look toward, I, I'm a native Washingtonian, and I remember uh, my father driving me past the White House at night uh, so I could see how beautiful it was. And uh, I remember as I got older, I used to roller skate by there during the day. Uh, and I look you at- You can still do that now. I can still do that, right? And I kind of look at uh, the Statue of Liberty as you come into New York with the grand lady holding her arms open, welcoming people to our and then they see uh, the White House where we seem to have all of a sudden had that uh, siege mentality and we've sort of given up that pioneer spirit that Americans have had. Uh, once you start chipping away at what we feel is what makes us uniquely Americans, it, you never know how we, we may eventually evolve as a people and as a culture. Uh, I think there's, it, it makes certainly uh, all the sense in the world to strive to open the avenue. I think the RAND study uh, accomplishes that. I, this latest presentation that I've just seen today um, probably has some good points. Uh, and I don't necessarily uh, uh, feel that the NCPC thing will get too
too bogged down, but my other uh, job on a full-time basis is heading up the Anacostia Economic Development Corporation, and we've certainly seen plans and plans and plans that get on shelves, and they never, nothing ever happens. So I'm certainly leery about it to some degree. Uh, but uh, if we can put some t kind of firm timetable on this, I think what they propose to do in terms of bringing all parties to the table and having them work openly uh, to resolve this has merit. And, but I don't want to see it dragged out just as John has just uh, spoken to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. And incidentally, um, uh, uh, just, the three just who are here were all at the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative right. kickoff. And it was just very, very exciting. Maybe finally that is moving. And I know um, Congresswoman uh, Norton had been involved with that also from the beginning. Right. Mr. Gwynn. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mrs. Norton, for your initial comments. I, those were right on the money. And thank you. And uh, Ms. Morella, I, I w would invite you, just as Mrs. Norton has come by one of our Federation banquets, uh, you'll be getting an invitation, as will Mr. Platts also. Uh, uh, if Being on this committee, to digress just a little, I, I, I hope you all will take more of an interest in the, the District of Columbia on the civic side also. We cordially invite you to, and you'll find that it's interesting. This is the most fun group, perhaps, because they're reminiscence types. But I would just like to, to close my remarks with, there's no such thing as complete security for our embassies abroad, for the, the nation's capital itself, as we see, or for the, uh, the Capitol buildings, or for the White House. We have to just proceed with good sense and mitigate the danger as much as possible, but, but <coughs> continue with our natural, uh, with the normal national life. I think there's no alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Well, I think uh, two themes that uh, went through all the speakers today were not to be held hostage to fear, and of course the, the symbolism or the that's portrayed by the area being closed down uh, type of uh, uh, how, how that might have been as far as, a, as, as an achievement in trying to become a more closed society. The other thing that I thought was interesting was the, the beautification aspects of um, the area looks now and how um, some of the foundations have included beautification aspects of it as well. I think if you'll remember down near the, and I, I mentioned this in my remarks, by the Martin Luther King Library, F Street or G Street was closed for a number of years. It became a terrible um, eyesore down there when that area was, was limited to, it had full access to pedestrian traffic, but it was closed to vehicular traffic and it became very run down. Um, another interesting thing is that um, uh, Nelson Ryman Snyder, who's retired, retired um, um, from uh, government work here in the city, has some interesting historical perspectives on um, previous, I'll just say, conflicts between the U.S. Secret Service and um, the building. Uh, buildings and um, uh, permits and all in the White House area, and he has that summarized in a document that I would like to share or provide to the committee for the record as well, if you would accept that. That objection is so ordered. Uh, you know, our group, I appreciate Guy's comment, our group being a fun group. I, I'm very sincere when I say we, we do have members that used to frolic and cut through the White House grounds. We have members um, group that used to um, exercise President Harding's dogs and, and be fed ice cream and cookies in the basement of the world. terrific stories. We know that we'll never go back to those days of openness and all, but um, we think there are plans that um, open Pennsylvania Avenue. I would suggest that if you're concerned about it's been almost six years now since these temporary measures were put into effect, I would suggest you're concerned about paralysis by analysis. Unfortunately, I think we may be sitting here five years from now after, you know, the one group studies it and provides their comments to another group and they're studied and shelved and restudied. I think um, one thing that might spur this on is if this committee would recommend to uh, President Bush the immediate reopening of Pennsylvania Avenue with whatever um, temporary measures restricting traffic to begin with and 
that might provide some impetus for the NCPC and other groups to work uh, more quickly to come to some resolution. Thank you, Madam Congresswoman. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. I'm now going to defer to Mr. Platts. Uh, Ms. Norton has agreed to that for any comments. Thank you, Madam right. Chairwoman, and, and uh, thank you, Ms. Norton, for allowing me to jump in here. I apologize for running off to yet another meeting. Um, three quick questions. Actually, Mr. Lowson, uh, on your presentation, the uh, checkpoints you envision, you don't mean every car being, being the opportunity for more scrutiny as they come through, is that correct? That's correct. And is there a, um, a cost estimate for uh, the recommendations, your design, and is there any ballpark figure on cost? And, and itself, is there uh, the, the radius you, you get in inside of Madison and on each side, the driveway from the White House before you begin the, the Jefferson um, arch or, or, or you know, radius? Is there a reason you didn't begin Jefferson and Madison, you know, the earlier to get a wider, larger distance? Aesthetically, the White House. Just is it, from a security sense, there would be a greater if we uh, began as soon as we got to Madison. And, uh, well, as, as I described, the solution is a blend between security features and yes, aesthetics. Sir. And we, which I neglected to mention, that our gates and light are all from the existing gates, whatever solution is applied, it should be complete the surrounding buildings like it's always been there. We feel that a, a design such as we've proposed has the ability to doing that. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and participants for your testimony as we try to find a work solution to the issue. Platts, and thank you for your input. Involvement. Uh, Congresswoman Norton, recognize you. Chair, uh, let me apologize. I was called off, off of uh, the campus of the House of Representatives altogether. This entirely the second panel. I'm certainly uh, pleased that I was able to at least return for part of this panel uh, in a very real sense to uh, personify what worries me most about the closing of the avenue, if you look at who it really affects, it, 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 it has had an untold effect in the whole, because I think it still is untold, because it's very hard to quantify it. It's very hard to characterize it. Uh, businesses, residents that use the area, the thing is I would, I would um, uh, bet that Greater effect has been on people from. Columbia. Uh, of course, uh, this is the District of Columbia, and if you're a resident of the District of Columbia, on any day of the week you may find yourself in this area. But if you're coming here over the 14th Street Bridge uh, or over the Memorial Bridge, you may have to find your way into this area just to do work. Um, and we've not found a good way to understand what it does. I'm very interested in understanding what this does because. We are doing it with no forethought. An incident occurs, you just shut it down. Uh, you don't think about alternative methods. You, you, the Secret Service comes through and says, we're, you know, we're always looking for alternatives and find any. Um, I, as I understand it, while I was gone, there, you, you, didn't, you didn't attempt to quantify, uh, and I don't know why, what the effect has been uh, economically on the district or on business. Um, I would ask, uh, I would like our record to show more, at least anecdotally, of what it means to have the street closed down, more than what I hear from residents, more than what I hear from businesses, for example. Do any of you have any information on the effect, for example, on, on um, the property in 
area on rents in that area compared to elsewhere in the District of Columbia would be important to us. People from Maryland and Virginia only tax people who do business in who live in the District of Columbia. So the federal government wants and most people who use that area come from around Virginia. If the federal government wants to the avenue and depress property values, they expect them to be. We need to know that. We don't have a basis to go to the look. This at least in the ballpark of what so I'd first ask if uh, if at on, on the basis of knowing businesses or knowing residents, any sense of what the inconvenience amounts to? I mean, simply uh, from a quantity point of view, what does it mean to a business to be located uh, where people across Pennsylvania get there before and now uh, are to get there from here? Uh, we need, uh, well, I need to hear what you, what you may have heard also need you, if you would, to ask of your own uh, members so that we can vivify what this means in terms that we can make and, uh, and other members understand. Is there any information that would lead us to understand what it means to an individual, what it means to have that kind uh, right from under them. Norman Norton, I do, and I can give a couple, three different examples. I would tell you that Church and probably Tom Dunney at the quite happy because the folks that were one house back on the beach and the beach came in and washed them out real estate closest to the water. So you basically have taken out all the real estate between that, that H Street corridor and used to be there. Our city, at least not from our perspective, one of our businesses is a commercial moving storage. We, the, there is the vibrancy that's that's associated with the West End and the center part of the city any longer. Don't want to be there? Just not as um, it's not as live environment. I, I would take um, uh, I, I would ask people in Virginia more probably 500 people into in different assignments, whether it be driving trucks limousine, half vehicles, vans, that kind of stuff. And they put up a third, third, and a third. Third originate from Washington, a third come from Virginia, and a third come from Maryland. The bifurcation of the city or splitting it in half, uh, it, it, it certainly does affect people in Maryland as to how they get to the city. Sitting on, on one-way streets that used to be two meters, um, it, it I would tell you that this may sound like an off shot, but it's realistic. Jobs that we are, are in, in Washington, where before we used to charge a one travel fee, whether that's a limousine, a bus, or a truck to get there, we now charge an hour and 20 minutes. It's just, it's, it just takes 20 minutes longer to go to the city. I mean, and you just cannot appreciate the delay in the cost of businesses like ours. In uh, uh, say that, 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 that relative to the, um, to, to the flow, it, but when you, we, 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 we normally spend about $100,000 a year, and, and some mentioned earlier about $700,000 they, that they've lost in, in meter revenue, in ticket fees. I know UPS spends about a million in, in, in tickets in, in, in the city. Uh, we spend about $100,000 a year. From 1990, when that road was closed, our, that our cost went up 15%. Now, a lot of that's a cost of doing business. It's just it's from, from, from loading and, and, a, and, a, and a loading standpoint. But when you begin to put to commerce, and I'm not talking about putting trucks on Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm talking about taking trucks off of H Street from a delivery standpoint. It's just it's, it's almost impractical to make deliveries there. It does affect how we do business. And it's not just a issue. It's it's a regional issue. Uh, do any of any of the other panelists have any uh, stories from there uh, that they could tell us? Uh, I would, would, and I'd be willing to work with you uh, to newsletter. Some of you, employees, uh, 
would be helpful how to make the powers that it turns out really to be the uh, I'm trying this decision can be made collectively because I think part of the nobody wants to take the rap for opening it close you're certainly not going to convince people to open if they think but <laughs> don't know uh, the real costs on real people. So I would your offices on designing uh, your own organizations or yourselves on designing an appropriate survey just so we have some sense of what the uh, personal cost is to businesses and to residents. Uh, Madam Chair, I simply want to thank the, um, the members of the panel, some of them about this, this testimony it's longer than we usually have in the district of but I certainly want to thank you for, for your testimony that I did not hear more of it and to assure you that I will on this issue until we get it done. We just cannot say, well, so get it done. You can if you go back and work with me on ways to vivify so that we all understand uh, or the harm that is understand the harm that is done, we will help find ways to get around the harm. Say, if you don't know is, then it's harder to think of a, a solution. If we need a better solution, you can help us get to that. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Ms. Norton, I, I agree. We have done. I'm now pleased to recognize uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, <laughs> the closing ramifications on the region, and of course, one is the transportation ramification, which uh, you, you've discussed. Uh, Pollution ramifications. It has just a uh, uh, addressed by it. the uh, ramifications to the city at large. And I'm wondering if anybody tag on this in terms of the economic development loss for the city, base ripple effects. You think there are any business not to come down because it's a little bit longer commute now? To parking. I know the Riggs Bank issue. Um, anybody either or uh, scientific information on Well, uh, Congressman Davis, you're doing well right now. We have a low vacancy rate down. We're not, uh, we're not losing companies anymore. We have, they want to move into Washington now. And it, you know, no, thanks. Avenue, that has nothing. I mean, if any, it's been a deterrent. Well, but what, what I'll be honest with you, uh, help the city to revive itself is the fact that relative to Maryland and Virginia suburbs, D.C., uh, is a good place to commute in business in because you can get around. And the fact that the roads are clogged up in D.C. is revived, has a lot to do with reviving the city, to be honest with you. The fact that Pennsylvania Avenue is closed is, is something we have to sell around. We have to sell that Washington is a, is a place where you can come in three hours worth of commute time you lived here or you put your business because eventually you've got to come into the city. It's not necessarily that everybody who lives here has to go out to Fairfax and do business, but everybody has to come in. Right. Uh, so it, it, it presents an obstacle to trying to sell that uh, there are just can't get around in. And that's for a town that's trying to revive itself right now. It's so important for us to have the advantage of, of being able to offer people uh, off their, their commuting time on a daily basis to to have their business here and to even live here as a selling point for Washington, quite aside from the fact that the government is turning itself around and now energize right. the government and all. Well, let me ask this. Is there any, do uh, you have any feel for what this has done to tourism? I mean, in the old days, the first buses could go to the White House. If you were lucky enough, you could get out and stay in line. You have to park off or you don't get the direct. Uh, you can let them off and spend a 20 go around to the other end of the White House if you're driving. Why people can walk right. across. But we heard testimony earlier to actually help the White House tour uh, in terms of pedestrian traffic. We heard from an earlier testimony uh, in terms of yeah, but that's economic. I mean, that's a, no, that's it's not a, helping the city. What we exactly. want to do is get people off the mall. We have, you know, we have a, the city has a tourist in the Ronald Reagan building. Yeah, I'm traffic. glad that it's easier for the White House and more convenient maybe for in terms of the economic impact. It doesn't help the city because most of those don't do the rest of the city, and that, that's the problem. I mean, we want we want people to see the White House, but the 
White House or the Capitol, then they, they generally leave because all the leave very little money on, on the table because museums are free, as you all know, and so is the White House. Uh, the whole aim is to get parts of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that doesn't do anything for us to close in Pennsylvania. It does nothing to uh, tourists uh, coming to unless you sell hot dogs or T-shirts. <laughs> Basically, this just makes it tougher. I know my commute. This just makes it tougher for, for people. And it just clogs up roads. Really, we're not uh, built for this. And that, of course, has an effect on uh, and, and a lot of air pollution. Uh, let me just say, I am uh, grateful for the fact that you are whining and criticizing, putting forward some plans uh, into the record that. Uh, moved by the cooperative attitude of everyone who'd like to try to solve this problem. If we can get there or not at this point and what the timing will be, I think will depend on all of our collective uh, determination to try to move this forward as an agenda item. But I appreciate all of you uh, taking the time. Sorry I wasn't here for all the testimony and other committees going on, but appreciate the chairman uh, holding this here, all of you coming out as well, and hopefully we can find a satisfactory solution. Thank you. Madam Chairman. I want to thank you, uh, particularly this third panel, for being here uh, almost all day, spending your time with us. We very much appreciate your testimony. It went along with it, the experiences that you have reflected. Uh, I think it's time now to and go into the actions, and that's what we hope to do in this subcommittee. Help and so continue to keep us. So, again, thank you very much, and I wanted to acknowledge some. Uh, Work very hard on this hearing. Uh, staff, Russell Smith, Bob White, uh, Matthew Bott, he of Azarani uh, Fields, uh, Mr. Davis, Jeff Howie Dent, Alyssa Wolfpack on the minority side with Gene Goff and uh, John Boker. I want to thank uh, I, the, the transcripts, which has. As is tradition, we will keep the record open for other testimony uh, within the next two. Thank you very much. The committee hearing is adjourned.